Hi, everyone. Good morning. It's, um, it's 10 o'clock, so we're, we're going to begin. I'm Kelly Green, and I'm the town meeting moderator uh, again this year. Um, and this is Joyce Mizuko. Joyce is our town clerk and treasurer. Um, and um, she's, she's, she's great. <laughs> yeah. Before we begin, I have a few announcements. Um, man, I had a lot. I had a lot to say, but I'm just going to scrap it all because we have a really long agenda. But um, welcome to our first, as far as I know, Saturday town meeting. Right? Um, you all voted to move town meeting to Saturday. And um, if it doesn't work out, you can vote to move it back some other time. But, but here we are. And um, now, you know, there's no conflict with Mardi Gras. Uh, I think we should have a huge round of applause for Sunrise Rotary, who served us all breakfast this morning. Is anyone here from Sunrise Rotary? Is, is there anyone here? Are they all upstairs clean in the kitchen? Oh, if, if anyone sees someone from Sunrise Rotary come down, stand up and yell so that we can thank them. Uh, a couple other of announcements. Gifford Hospital uh, is required to update their community needs assessment for the federal government. So they've asked, um, me to ask you all if you want to fill out a survey that is in the lobby about your needs. So that's out there. Another exciting announcement um, is that the Gear House Bike Shop and Rasta Outdoor Hub opens tomorrow, March 1st. Um, I don't know if I'm allowed to make, you know, like advertisements for commercial establishments, but I'm gonna, um, because I, it's, it's relevant in that, um, I, it's just a super exciting time to, to be living in Randolph, isn't it? Um, there's a lot going on. This is one of the many things going on. So you should all stop in, even if you're not a cyclist, um, because I was told today that they're going to be selling socks. And everybody needs socks, um, so there's something. There's definitely going to be something for everyone there. So, so check it in, check check it out. Um, they're going to have a grand opening celebration March 28th, uh, and um, you should come. Aldolfo is definitely going to be there. <laughs> oh, I'm already get, I'm already getting some uh, <laughs> some criticism here that we're dragging on. <laughs> um, uh, Janet Watton from Chandler is here. Janet, wave. Yeah, thanks for... Um, <laughs> Janet is going to um, give us some halftime entertainment where what Chandler does generously every year is hides... hides um, well, we're going to do a raffle. That's what we're going to do. And it's great, and you're going to win free tickets. And like a lot of people actually win um, because they give away a lot of tickets. So we'll be doing that in a little while. When things get boring, uh, or when I'm confused as to what's going on, I'll, I'll, just, call, I'll just call you up. <laughs> okay, uh, you know how to be recognized if you've been here before, but if you haven't been here before, to be recognized, you just need to raise your hand. You have to wait for a microphone, and um, someone will bring you a microphone, or you can use this microphone up front. Please state your name when, before you start speaking and direct your comments to me. Um, only registered voters may speak. If you are a non-registered voter, if you're not registered here, please let us know when you stand up that you're not a registered voter and I will grant you permission to speak if there's no objection. And if there's an objection, then um, the, the voters get to get to decide that question. 
this is super important. This is a state law that I have to follow. And we've gotten by every year by just doing it in this sort of casual way. Other towns, they make you sign in and you have a card and it's a whole big ordeal. So we've, we've, we've been able to do this because people recognize um, themselves as non-voters when they, when they stand up to speak. And if you see someone uh, who is speaking who you know not to be a voter, please object. Each speaker gets 10 minutes per article. I don't know that anybody's ever used that amount of time. That's actually a really long amount of time. Um, you may speak a second time on an article, but only after everybody else has had a chance to speak. So with that, I will, oh, oh, Joyce actually has some important announcements. Uh, just a couple of reminders. Um, please uh, file your HS-122 Homestead Declaration and your HI-144 uh, income form with the Vermont Department of Taxes. Uh, most residents in the town of Randolph uh, will qualify and may potentially uh, qualify for a tax adjustment credit, which will help them with their uh, education portion of their uh, property taxes. So I really strongly encourage everyone to please file those on time. That way you don't get penalized with a penalty, which will reduce um, potentially what you may receive as a credit. Um, quite a number of people in Randolph qualify to have almost all their taxes um, paid through that tax adjustment credit. So please, if you know of seniors who own property, encourage, you know, a lot of times seniors don't have to file income taxes. Please encourage them to file their income tax as far as the Homestead Declaration and the HI-144. It really makes a big difference and I really would like to see that everyone who qualifies for it can take advantage of it. Um, the other th piece is that there will be two rabies clinics held um, in March. The first one will be March 21st, which will be held at the Randolph Regional Veterinary Hospital on Dillon Drive um, from uh, 9 to 11. Um, and I will be there to license dogs. Also, the second one will be held on March 27th at the town hall. The Randolph Animal Hospital will be at the town hall to uh, administer the rabies vaccination and we will be open that day for tax collection and for dog licensing. Um, and I think that's it. Thank you and I apologize for forgetting your messages. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Don't forget, your taxes are due March 31st. <laughs> yeah, so thank you. Um, so if you would all please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance Thank you so much. Um, please, uh, if you have a copy of the town report with you, that's great. We probably have extras here. The warning, which is going to govern today's meeting, starts on page one. As many of you know, uh, articles one through 26 are voted on by Australian ballot. The voting will take place on Tuesday, March 3rd, meaning this coming Thursday, uh, Tuesday, between 7 a.m. 7 and 7 p.m. at Town Hall. So we've always voted on a Tuesday. We'll continue to vote on those Australian ballot items on Tuesday, 7 to 7 at the Town Hall. We can discuss the articles. Um, so let's move on to Article 1. In the past, you may recall that we weren't allowed to discuss here at the meeting Article 1 but because we have changed the day of our meeting and polling is not happening today, we can discuss Article 1 now. Um, next year, I'm sure Article 1 is going to take up a lot of time. <laughs> but let's uh, open the floor if there's any discussion of Article 1 this year.
All right. I, I, see, I see no hands, and no one wants to talk about um, that. So we shall move on to Article 2. Some of these articles I'm not going to read to you, and some of them I am. I'm not going to read Article 2 to you, but it relates to the town general fund, which is located, uh, the budget is located on pages 40 through 50 of your town report. And um, let's open the floor if there's any discussion of uh, Article 2 or the general fund. I'm going to move on to Article 3. I'm speaking very slowly, you'll notice, because I just want to make sure you're good with moving on, which is fine. Um, I don't want to rush anyone. Article 3 relates to the Town Highway Fund. And the Town Highway Fund is located on pages uh, 52 through 54 of your, of your town report. So we'll open the floor to discussion of Article 3. Thank you. Kristen Chandler just noted that there are um, town reports in the hall if you need some. Yeah, I see, I, I see, I see one hand. Well. Is this on? Yeah. Oh. Somebody's got to get this started, Kelly. Um, can I ask Marty Strange, a little on Pleasant Street, can I uh, ask permission to go back to Article 2? Yes, and if there's no objection, I'll let you go back to Article 2. Okay. Thank you. Um, I see in the administrative expense budget that we've reduced the amount planned to be spent for um, the economic development director. At the same time, um, I, as I understand it, I may be wrong, that we have arranged to have that person serve as the replacement for Marty Chan Sanchez in the Planning Commission. Uh, I want to ask if there is not possibly a conflict of interest between merging those two positions. I, I wonder, um, who, who would you like to answer that question? Does anyone have an answer to that question? Did you all hear? Did you all hear? Did you all hear Marty's question? Um, Mr. Strange. Well, my concern about a potential conflict of interest is that the person responsible for administering the zoning regulations may have a conflict of interest with the person responsible for raising economic development. That some pro economic development projects may raise planning and zoning issues that ought not to be decided by the same person. Thank you. I, I see um, our, our town manager, Adolfo Bailon. Well, uh, Adolfo, ba Adolfo Bailon, Randolph Village. Um, uh, Mr. Strange is correct. We have uh, currently our economic development director serving as uh, zoning administrator. Uh, that position was filled because of uh, retiring of our previous zoning administrator. Uh, I serve as the deputy zoning administrator, so if there is ever an issue where there's a conflict, I'm more than willing to step in. Uh, however, the zoning regulations are very, they're, they're very black and white. It's either you can do it or you cannot do it. Uh, and if there is a potential conflict where we can make a change to allow a business to move into town, it's not a person making that decision. That decision has to go to the planning commission so that they can then review the regulation and the zoning and the land use regulations. They could make suggested changes that requires a hearing, so we have to notify everyone in the public. Then requires a second hearing for the select board, so that then the select board could have a hearing. So it takes several months before someone can make an action that affects a particular district or a business. Um, but again, the regulations are very, they're, they're very binary. It's either yes, you can do it, no, you cannot do it. Um, and if in some instances you can do it, it goes to several committees to, to make a change. There is one instance, if, if there's one item where 
something is conditional or it can be done, but you need extra steps, uh, you could also then take it to the design review, uh, development review board so that that committee can review the work. They can determine if this project is in the best interest of the town, best interest of the people, is it, if it affects the, the district as a whole. So again, it's, it's not one person interpreting the rules, it's one person interpreting the rules if there is interpretation, but then sending it to a committee for discussion which requires hearing and public notice. Thank you. Other discussion of Article 2? Maria Puglisi, Randolph a Village. I still think it's a, a conflict of interest um, because we have a, a system in this town and other towns as well that um, meetings are lightly attended and um, interests that I would disagree with might go right through even though uh, within those meeting times. So I, I think it's a conflict of interest. I'm not sure why it was done that way. Um, whether it was just easy to do it then or to reduce costs or, or what, but I think there is a better way to do it. Thank you so much. Uh, Michael Penrod, um, I would like to ask the town manager if this is a permanent solution or th is this just a temporary solution because uh, Marty Sanchez retired and can we expect those two positions to be filled in the future by two different people? Mr. Balon, would you like to answer that? Okay. Uh, so uh, the position was filled in this, in this manner than what we have now because we advertised the position for several months. Um, we couldn't find anyone to, to serve in the role. We literally had no applicants. And then we had a second round release for several more weeks, which at that point we ended up having uh, two applicants. Um, we are in the process of potentially making a, a, an offer to someone to serve as an administrative uh, person, essentially serve, uh, do the paperwork, become, get up to speed, once they learn the role, they, depending on the select board decision, could then fill the role of zoning administrator. So we took the, the actions that we did to have somebody who was already a town employee serve as the zoning administrator because we literally could not find someone to even apply for the job. Um, so rather than have a job empty, not have any one of your permits for adding a remodeling or adding a room to your home just completely not be approved, we had somebody in-house uh, take the position so that we could process these permits because if we don't have anybody as a zoning administrator, no one in town could do any work on their home that requires a permit. Uh, but yes, the, the goal is to, as soon as we extend an offer to someone to, do, to learn the job, be on the job for a while, they would then serve as a zoning administrator and then it would be two different, two peop two different people. Thank you. Mr. Strange. Let me ask first if there are other comments um, about this subject, and then we will let you speak. It looks like you can, you have the floor. Uh, thank you. Um, I don't find it credible that the planning and zoning rules are cut and dried so that there's never any conflict. They've been around too long. And, um, it's also the case that the person who makes the first call on anything like that establishes the default position that somebody else has to override. I don't think that person should be in a position where they have competing interests as the person who developed the project that's in the conflict. And I just, I just don't think it's credible. Moreover, I'm concerned that it took us a long time to get to the point where we had a full-time economic development director, and now we don't. And I think that's a problem as well. Thank you, um, right here in front. I'm Phyllis Forbes and I, uh, I, I live in, are we supposed to state where we live? I am gonna assume you're all Randolph Town Village yes. unless you say otherwise. So one of the wonderful things about Marty was when we did anything is that we always felt that Marty was there to help us. She was 
didn't have a different agenda. She was reading the rules as best she could for us to be able to do what we do. I think combining those two positions would give a sense to some people that, that there may be another agenda at play here. And if this is going to be a temporary, I, we should know how long it's going to be, but if it's going to be permanent, I, personally, I think it's, a, it, it's an appearance of conflict that could promote a conflict or could promote an issue with people and reduce the uh, effectiveness of that position. Thank you, Mrs. Forbes. Um, I'm going to see, are there, are there other comments? Oh, way in the back. Thank you for calling my name. Thank you. My name's Dick Pay. I live in Randolph Village. Uh, I'm less concerned about the conflict of interest. Uh, I'm more concerned about the fact that, as I recall, Marty Sanchez was a degreed civil engineer. And that qualification, that professionalism, is very important in the zoning field. And we lose that, we dilute that, by putting someone into that job, even on a part-time basis, we, uh, the economic development director has, in my opinion, good reputation so far. Things are going well. I'd like to see him develop as an economic development director and find an engineer to do the zoning work, spend whatever time is necessary to fill the job. Thank you. Thank you very much. See if there are other people who would like to speak about this issue. Giving you a minute to think about it. I see someone. Is that Mrs. Putney? Yep. <laughs> All right, you've got me. Hang on, let's see here. Mr. Balan, um, I think you've spoken twice about it, so I'll, I'll ask you to hold off on this one. Uh, sure, but just to clarify, one was a response as opposed to me making a comment, and the second one was a comment, so this would be my second comment, with one of them being a response to a question. Let, let's, let's move on, but thank you. I, I do see a hand up in the back there. Um, if we do object to the, yes, the Joan Sachs, uh, Randolph <laughs> Thank you, Center. Mrs. Sachs. Um, if we do object, and I kind of agree with the people that are objecting to combining these two, what do we do about it in terms of vote? Do we vote down the budget? What do we do? Because it's kind of fixed in stone at this point. It's a very excellent question. Are there more comments? Martha Hafner, uh, I agree. And I would wonder whether a show of hands could be done in order to get a sense of how many people think that there is a potential concern here. It's up, it's up to you all if that's what you would like to do. Would you like to make a motion for a show of hands? Second. So there's, there's, there's been a motion to see whether we should have a show of hands as to whether you feel like there's a conflict or not. Um, let's, let's, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, it's kind of lame, right? Yeah, I, I hear you. But um, w go ahead. Because we could just do it. <laughs> the, the question is whether the intent of the motion is to urge, if, if it's a yes vote, is to urge people to vote down the general plan. I want to budget. I mean, I want to make clear that that's not my intent. I'm just trying to send a signal, and and I'm, I'm going to vote to approve the general budget when the time comes. Thank you. I see Ms. Gately's hand up. Can we vote on just? Um, 
at least looking into splitting the position again or changing that aspect of it without ditching the whole budget? It's not warned. So no, you, you actually can't do that here and now. Well, on the floor is a motion as to whether we should have a show of hands as to whether you all feel like um, there is a conflict of interest or not. And we have a long day ahead of us. And so um, I'm going to throw this out there to you. Um, I, I am here only to do what you all want to do, right? But uh, so shout me down if you don't want to do this. But if there is no objection, I will allow a show of hands. It's not binding as to whether you feel like there's a conflict of interest in having these two com positions combined or not. That's right. No discussion. This is just on whether you want to have a show of hands. <laughs> okay. All right, all those in favor of having a show of hands, say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. Aye. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. The motion is adopted. Um, would you like to discuss having the show of hands further, or would you just like to do that? Do Let's just do it. Show of hands, please. Raise your hand if you feel like it is a conflict of interest to combine the two positions of economic development director and, and zoning administrator. Raise your hands high. OK. And raise your hands high. Now put your hands down and raise your hands high if you think it's not a conflict. All right. We're not counting this vote, but thank you. Um, you kind of have a sense of what the room is. Oh, well, it looked, eh, it looked like mm, slightly more people felt like it was a, a conflict of interest. All right, so we are still on Article 2. And now we're going to have lots of conversations, but we've got some new people who want to talk. And we'll start in the back of the room, and I've, I, I, can, I, can see your, I can see your hands. Sheila Clark. We just recently moved back to Randolph, and we will be having some work done at our house, and I would really like to be able to get zoning permits done. So I guess I'd like to see a zoning person stay. Thank you. I think that's uh, probably everyone's sentiment. <laughs> there a hand right up here. Patsy French from Randolph as a former elected official and the spouse of an elected official currently. Anyone who has strong feelings either way, talk to your, all your select board members. Let them know how you feel. Tell your friends to talk to their select board members as well. Thank you. Mrs. French, thank you so much. That directly addresses Mrs. Sachs's uh, question, and that's very helpful. Yeah, you should contact the select board. For sure. Are there all of all, yeah, all select board members, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> yes, <laughs> point taken. <laughs> um, all right, Article 2. We are going to move on to Article, oh, point, Article 2. Hang on, wait for a um, microphone and. Um, Remember to state your name. Hi, I'm Cynthia Quilici. I live in Randolph Village. Um, and uh, just kind of looking over the general uh, expenses and revenues, there's three categories that seem to have just leapt up enormously. One is the fire department expenses have seemed to have gotten up like 30% over the last like four years. Uh, and recreation also seems to have uh, doubled in one category and again gone up like 30%. And my perception of us, the general situation going forward, is that we are in a period of really economic de growth. And while I realize there are a lot of 
contractual issues and state things that kind of drag the entire budget in a certain direction, I'm wondering how many of these optional things we can really uh, afford to increase at that rate going forward, and that's just a general concern. Thank you very much for your comment. Other remarks about the general fund, Article 2? Hello. Tim Angel, just to address the fire department, I believe that all, most all of that is because some of the items for the fire department that were in capital budget are now in the general fund. Thank you, Mr. Angel, you. for your comment. Thank you. Yeah. Other comments about Article 2? Kristen Chandler. Kristen Chandler. I, I serve Also, on the, wait, first, thank you for the microphone. You're welcome. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 That's huge. It's a long day, people. Um, I, I actually uh, volunteered for this because I did it last year, but I roped into in Kristen Gage this morning to do it, so I think she ought to get some recognition. Kristen actually. Gage. <laughs> yes. Um, I serve on the Recreation Committee, and I, my understanding is part of that recreation budget going up is because of the pool uh, expenses in repairing the pool, which is enjoyed by uh, lots and lots of youth here, and, and adults, I should say, here in mm -hmm. town, as well as uh, lots of other activities that the Recreation uh, Department has brought to town that we never had before or that we have brought back to town that many, many residents are enjoying. Thank you so much. <laughs> Those are great explanations to a great question, so thank you. Yeah. Article two. Can you hear the panic in my voice? <laughs> we could stay all night, I got no plans. There is a boys basketball game at five o'clock. There is a boys, yeah. that I, I, there is a boys basketball game at five o'clock. And there's a concert here. There's a concert here. <laughs> and they're gonna set up at three right here. <laughs> All right, so let's move on then to Article 3, which is about the Town Highway Fund. Again, the budget for that is on page 52 to 54. I'm giving you a minute to think about whether you have a question or comment because I misread the room <laughs> in the last article. <laughs> but seeing no hands, oh, Mr. Strange is struggling. I'll give you a second to think. If you want to comment, comment. This is it. This is, this is our meeting. Marty Strange, and I've already talked more today than I have at any other town meeting. So. You're good. You're good. I see that um, there's a pavement pa patching line item here. And Lord knows we need some patching. Um, <laughs> I pulled a small dog out of a hole today. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but I think that this really comes up under capital budget. Is that not correct? I'm, well, I'm, asked, I'm a, now, ask the experts that. I saw, I, saw an, I saw an expert hand go up right here in the front. Holly Sanders, chair of the Capital Budget Committee. Uh, if you look at the Capital Budget Committee report, uh, a number of items have changed from the Capital Budget Committee to the budget, mainly because they are operating annual expenses, not capital improvement expenses. Uh, unfortunately, potholes come into that category. So therefore, they, uh, 
the rate that they are paid are come under the budget committee's purview, not the capital budget committee's purview anymore. Thank you so much. Article three. I'm looking for hands about Article 3, and if I don't see any, we'll move on to Article 4. Oh, I see a hand for Article Article 2. Oh, okay. Don't take us back. We're not going back again. Article 4 relates to the library. And um, there's a couple places. The library budget's on page 50 and 51, and then the library's report is on page 78. And we have a, um, we have a trustee here who would like to speak. I'm Sally Penrod. Do I need to turn around? You can do I whatever can you like. You can, you can come up front. You no, can... no, no, no. First of all, before I say anything about the library, I want to point out that in the table of contents of your town report, there is a mistake. It's a big one. Rot row. It says, okay, it says proposed fiscal year 2019 budget. If there's a typo anywhere, Sally Penrod will see it. <laughs> Put that in the minutes. Okay, I want to talk about the library. And somebody said earlier, isn't it a great time to be in Randolph? It is. And great things are happening, but they're happening at the library too. We have, with everybody's help in town, we have decided on three super priorities for the next couple of years. And you, Amy's been handing out a flyer. I turned away. Amy's been handing out a flyer. And there'll be more around. I hope you'll take it. But I want to point out that our three strategic priorities are youth engagement, events and programs, and the building needs. Now, that's a lot. And we were given an incredible gift by Todd McNair. And we've decided, the trustees, the staff, We've decided to divide that in half, keep half of it in reserve for future, but we're gonna take half of what we're gonna use and divide that in half so that one quarter of the bequest goes to youth engagement, one quarter goes to events and programming, and half goes to building needs and exploration of how we can meet the needs of the community coming forward. We have committees established, they're at this point very small, but we need people from the town to come in and help us decide and how to do all of this. Now, also on this sheet of paper is your library value calculator for fiscal year 2019. The town allowed, the, uh, sorry, the library budgeted for that year $292,000 and change. The value was $924,772, more than three times what you actually spent. That's pretty fantastic. And the, what's not really seen in here is that what the value of the children's books checked out was 293,700 and some dollars, more than what we paid for the library. It's a fabulous resource. And I know most of us use it. But please, join a committee and help us, help us go forward. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Article four, Kimball Public Library comments. I see a hand up, Mrs. Sachs. I think I chose the wrong side of the room, Kristen. <laughs> Joan Sachs, I just want to say that the library is one of our most precious assets in this 
uh, town. It's simply wonderful. I've had people from other towns in Vermont tell me how great it is. So please appreciate and help with this library. It's a wonderful asset. Thank you. Article four, Kimball Library, discussion. We're going to move on to Article five. Article five, Article five um, has to do with repayment of sewer debt to the general fund. And um, I'll open the floor to discussion of Article five. I'm not seeing any hands. I'll give you another second to think about that. And we will move on to discussion of Article 6. I'm going to read Article 6 out loud to you and then open the floor to discussion. It says, shall the town voters authorize the sum up to $420,000 to be borrowed by the town for the purchase of two 10-wheel tandem trucks to replace one six-wheel and one 10-wheel truck in the highway department. Annual payments for each 10-wheel tandem truck will be included in subsequent annual budgets until the payment schedule has been fulfilled. Any revenues generated by the sale or trade-in of the six-wheel and the 10-wheel trucks will be used to offset the sum of $420,000. Someone did a nice job drafting that. Except there's a typo, Sally, in this sentence. Uh-oh. <laughs> Discussion about Article 6. Right over here. Kristen Gage to the rescue. Uh, Tamara Morgan, East Randolph. I just have a question about what a 10-wheel tandem truck is and what they're used for. It's a big uh, truck. It's a, <laughs> is it a longer truck? All right. So who, who here is the resident expert on trucks? Come on. Someone, someone here is. Who wants to answer Tamara's question? No one? I know there's someone. I know there's someone else besides Mr. Valon who had, we, he's got other, uh, all right, go ahead. Uh, you, sure. I don't want to exhaust you. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. I've been here all day. Or until three o'clock, right? <laughs> <laughs> so we can shut down. Um, uh, the ten-wheel trucks are the they, they're the large utility trucks that the town uses to plow, to transport sand and salt into the to the town for winter operations, or when we have to do ditching or uh, debris removal. Um, we actually just to let everyone know, we we put the amount up to four hundred twenty thousand just to make sure that we were covered. We did receive uh, proposals earlier this week that are far below the four twenty, so. We are expecting not to get to the 420, but that's what the trucks are for. It's to keep bringing material in and to keep the roads clear as best we can. Thank you. We have two, two folks here. We'll get, we'll get to them both. Hi, I'm Michael Penrod. Um, as a member of the uh, Budget Committee, uh, when this issue came up, I went out to the town garage and met with the guys and looked at these trucks. There's no doubt. No doubt at all, we need to replace these trucks. We were spending more repairing them than we would, would be uh, spending to buy a new truck. My understanding is from the guys that work out there, we shouldn't have any equipment that's over 10 years old. 10 years, get rid of it and move on. So this is one of those things where the, literally there are holes in the truck from hauling the salt and everything, they're falling apart. We need two new trucks, unfortunately. I feel like there's a hand in the back someplace, no? Okay, article six, thank you, Mr. Penrod, for going out and examining the trucks yourself. Tim Angel, again, I don't question the, the need of new dump trucks. What I question is going from six-wheel trucks to 10-wheel trucks. 
I live on the end of uh, Clay White Road and the plow truck drivers had troubles getting around um, with a 10 wheel truck. So the past two winters they've been plowing it with a bucket loader. But lo and behold, one snowstorm a couple weeks ago, a six wheel truck came up and zipped right around like nothing. And I'm afraid that uh, if they go to all 10 wheel trucks, the drivers might say, well, it's not safe and they might start closing down more roads like they did 14 of them last year because they can't plow them. Thank you for your point. I, have, I see a hand uh, right up here, Ms. Gage. <laughs> Who has some up, right up front here? You had, did you have your hand up? No, she was manning the camera. Ah, got it. Sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Raised hand. False okay. alarm. False alarm. <laughs> Anybody else want to address Article 6? Maria Puglisi, who, cho who chooses whether it's a six or 10 wheel truck? Is that, a, is it flexible? The question is, if this passes, is it flexible? And um, I don't know, I don't know the answer to that. It's kind of a technical question. How much, how much, how much Leeway does the town have to change what the voters voted on? Mr. Rankin, this is a good opportunity to introduce you to Cliff Rankin, who's our new, what, what is your title? B budget? I'm the finance director in town. The finance director, C Cliff Rankin. Say welcome, everyone. <laughs> Big crowd here today. I'm not used to speaking to so many. Um, so in regards to the question on the truck, we discussed this at length. And one of the things that we do, um, we've got a fleet of trucks. We've currently got two 10-wheel um, tandem trucks, which means it's a double axle in the back. So there's eight wheels on the roads. Um, the six wheelers, the smaller trucks are a seven-yard truck. The big 10-wheelers are a 14-yard truck. And when we're hauling a lot of sand and gravel to um, stockpile it in the yard up in the village and up in the center, that's capacity. And if you're hauling with a seven yard hours for personnel, twice as many hours on the trucks. Um, we're trying to balance the capacity of the trucks um, so that we've got some smaller trucks that work well in some of the smaller venues and the larger trucks that we can use to haul on the open roads. And the interesting thing is that the bigger trucks have the same fuel economy as the smaller trucks. Thank you. Oh, you got it? I got it. You, got, you want to do both? What are you doing? Multitasking here. All right, Article 6. Further go. questions? We're, we're, we're cleaning up some water up here. That's what's going on. Spill on aisle 4. All right, that's terrible. All right, moving on to Article 7, which relates to the police district budget, which you can find on um, pages 54 and 56. Yep. Oh, Article 7 is open for discussion if there is any. Kevin McGinch. Thank you. 
Mr. Bailon? Uh, so the voters uh, and the select board uh, voted um, over a year ago to establish a contract with the Sheriff's Department. Um, the issue of the police district goes back to the town's Articles of Merger of 1984-85, where the voters then decided to merge the village with the town, but only the, the then village, with the, which is now considered mostly the police district, um, was required to only pay for policing. And so now that the town no longer has a Randolph Police Department and now contracts with the Sheriff's Department, the police district continues to pay for policing because they choose to, and the, the Sheriff's Department, under that contract, patrols the police district area. Uh, the state police does, if called in for a, a major issue, uh, we've had some, you know, one or two over the last year or two, um, uh, the state police will come in to support the Orange County Sheriff's Department, but the primary law enforcement agency in the police district is the Orange County Sheriff's Department through a contract with the town. Thank you. Phyllis Forbes, if the contract is with the town, why is only, why are only the people in the police district paying for this? It's not a contract with the police district, it's a contract with the town. So the police district itself cannot enter into an agreement. Um, again, it goes back to what the voters wanted in 1984, 1985. Um, they wanted to maintain the Randolph Police Department or they wanted to pol maintain policing within their area. The remainder of the town back then did not want to pay for police services and so both, both groups in the mid-80s came to an agreement that only the police district would pay for policing. So that, that was a decision made by, by the voters at that point, not, not by anyone else. And so now we, we are continuing with that because only the voters can vote to change the existing police district. Both the, the district itself has to vote to change the borders of the police district. The town itself has to vote to change the borders of the police district. Um, so it's not a decision being made administratively. It's all a decision made by the voters over 30, 30 years. Kelly, I believe um, Sonny Holt has entered the room from the Sunrise Rotary. <gasps> Thank you so much. Sonny, are you here? Sonny, uh, just on behalf of all of us, thank you for breakfast. Yes. You're welcome. It was really great. We'll try to get an issue. I love it. Everybody was really grateful. And if you would pass that on. Hi, John Pemital, East Randolph. Uh, it's my understanding that the police are only patrolling within the village itself and not in the East Randolph area or, or other outskirting areas of Randolph. Is that correct? I can answer that question because I was on the committee. The people in the district pay for police services and receive police services. People outside the police district don't pay for services and don't have them, except for, you know, when there's an emergency and you call 911, the state police respond. I, I'm going to recognize Joyce. The Orange County sheriffs do also have a separate contract with the town that does right. speed control outside of the police district. There's yeah. two different contracts. One contract is for the police district, which covers the policing for the district. And then there's a separate contract that provides um, basically speed control within the outskirts of the police district so that when problem spots appear, they can get it under control. Thanks. Uh, Chris Recchia, uh, Randolph Teacher Hill Road. Joyce, you just raised that, which I did not realize it was a separate contract. So then that kind of raises the issue of, is there, um, when did the town voters outside the police district vote on that contract? Because um, I, for one, find that to be an annoying contract, but just, <laughs> just saying. <laughs> the question about do we have a vote in that contract is not rhetorical, however. I'd really like to hear how that works if it's, if it's a full town 
My understanding is the voters never voted on that specific right. contract, right? It's right. just in the general fund. Is that fair to say, Mr. Uh, Rankin? I, I don't have a definitive answer to that, uh, but I believe that's correct. Okay. Mr. Penrod. How much money are we talking about here in this separate town contract and what line item is it covered under? Does someone have an answer to that? I think Joyce is uh, Mr. At Mr. Balon probably knows that. Thank you. Uh, the item itself is found on page 43 under the executive budget. It's listed under uh, Orange County Sheriff. It is a $20,000 a year, or this year it's $20,000, and um, much of it is really when the Sheriff's Department has the capacity to perform the work. Uh, there are a lot of reports of speeding on, uh, especially um, on 66, right before it turns to 50 miles an hour, right before Ridge Road in that area. Um, there's patrolling there and there's patrolling in other areas that are, are, are frequent speeding problems. Thank you. Hi, Cynthia Quilici, uh, Randolph Village. Uh, a question about then revenues from the ticketing that goes on with that because a lot of towns will have a police force and there's an expense but then that's partially covered by the income coming from tickets. So when someone does get a speeding ticket in those areas, where does that money go? Let's, ha let's have Mr. Rankin answer. On page 40, under miscellaneous revenue, third line item down is Sheriff Department ticket revenue. It's budgeted for $5,000 for fiscal 2021. Thank you. Okay, Article 7. Going to move on to Article 8. Momentarily, we'll move on to Article 8 now. Article 8 is about the water district. It's a similar idea to the police district, I guess, but um, the budget is found on page 56, 7, and 8. Actually, why don't we combine discussion for water and sewer, Article 8 and 9. They go hand in hand. Article 8 and 9. Any questions about water and sewer operations? Oh, I see a hand up. I sub in various schools, and I know that in Bethel, there's a concern. Oh, I'm sorry, Martha Hafner. And I'm not going to stand because I just got an injection in my knee. Sorry. No, pro no problem. <laughs> no one has to stand. Um, so... In Bethel, there is a concern about lead that's appearing in the water inside the school. Um, I'm curious to know whether there's anybody that can comment on lead concerns in water in this area. Would anyone like to talk about lead in this uh, area? May not be a question or a problem, Mr. Balon. Make a general comment, uh, yeah. just uh, following conversations that I've had with our water superintendent just on 
the function of the water department. Lead is not a concern in any of the Randolph schools. Um, uh, did, you know, I'd like to qualify that by saying that Randolph schools are a part of a bigger district that includes other towns, but as far as Randolph schools, lead has not been a problem for, for us. Thank you. Kelly, can I just, hey, Seth, are there hearing uh, enhanced devices available with yes. these? So I just want to point out that we do have, um, if you have any trouble hearing at all, we have enhancement devices. If you need one, happy to pass that out to you. Just raise your hand if you'd like one. Yeah, here we go. Okay. Yeah, that's, thank you. Who's gonna go? you want, we're going to, we're going to work on that. Yep, so we'll get that device to you, and in the meantime, we'll take another comment. Uh, I'd like to know what the magnesium issue is. Has that been clarified? Did you, did, did you all hear that? Would you repeat that question? You mean manganese? Yeah. Manganese. Yeah. Um, so just repeat, hold that microphone parallel to the ground. and The manganese issue was an issue last year and the year before. Can we get an update on that? We can, and um, Mr. Balon can give us that. I will try to be as brief as possible. This is one of my soapbox issues over the last two years. <laughs> um, I, I will start out by saying that uh, manganese has been in the news and the state has required the town to put notices in your, in your, in your water bills. Um, I would like to point out that we took the state to court, we won. Uh, we, the court ruled that the town's position was correct, was that the state was not following state or federal regulations, for one. Uh, for two, what we pointed out to the state was that folks in Randolph would have to drink nearly 40 cups of water to get the amount of manganese that you'd take in your multivitamin every day. So that was one of the issues that we also raised to the state and said, well, if manganese is so bad, why is there so much of it in multivitamins? and the state had no answer for it. Um, so the issue with the manganese is, is that it, it, it has a distinct color and an odor to it. The, you know, not arguing that point. It has a distinct color and an odor to it. Um, but it, it is not dangerous. I can, I can tell you that it's not dangerous. You drink it, you eat it in leafy green vegetables, you drink it in your multivitamins, in almond milk, if you drink almond milk. I know drinking almond milk in this area is taboo. We all drink regular milk right here. <laughs> 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 But um, I do, do want to just stress that we have since continued our challenge with the state. The state seems to think that they are correct even though we've told them they're not. The court has told them that they're not. Um, they are not following state and federal regulations as they, sh as they should. Um, but like with any bureaucracy, it, even with the town, you've seen you work with the town sometimes, we move slowly. The state moves much more slowly than we do and the federal government moves way more slowly than anything we've all, ever seen. Um, so it'll take some time. The, the notices in your bills will likely change very soon and we'll not talk about the manganese thing, but we also want to move as slowly as we should to not antagonize, antagonize the state because we also apply for uh, state grants through the Agency of Natural Resources. And if we you know, upset someone up there, they could just take it out on the town and not grant us a grant. Um, so um, yes, manganese is still in your water. It does sometimes stain if you have um, you know, a, a white sink or your, your washing machine. Um, we do have materials in the water department that we can share with you to take some of the stain away. We are working to move ourselves away from the manganese well. Uh, what we're, what we're, we've applied for a grant, we, we got it. It was $450,000 for that grant. We're going to be going out for another grant that's another half million dollars. And so we're building these grant opportunities so that we don't pass another loan on to the users. We understand it's expensive to live in town. We understand we're working to try to make this change as painless for you because we, we certainly go out tomorrow and take out a bond if the select board said yes, um, but we don't want to do that because then that bill is paid by you. So we want to get as much free grant money as possible and that unfortunately takes time for the applications and everything else. So. Uh, but to make a short story a little longer, uh, I do want to just stress that this manganese issue is, is one that was created by a state agency that was not following federal and state regulations. 
and the amount of manganese that, if you were to drink 40 cups of water again, of, manganese, of water from Randolph, it's just as much manganese in those 40 cups combined than in your multivitamin, Centrum, whatever it is that you drink, so. Thank you. Irene Schaefer, uh, Randolph. I just want to state that there's no manganese in my vitamins. It's magnesium that's in my vitamin, but no, no manganese. Thank you. Water and sewer, article eight and nine. Oh, I see you, and we'll cut, we'll get right to you. Go ahead. Hi there. Can you? Can you state your name, Is Milo? this on? Yeah, um, Milo. Please Cutler. state your name. Milo Cutler. Um, I'm just on page 57. Can you clarify? Uh, down at the bottom, there's two lines for RF3 drinking water and Route 66 water project for over $75,000. That's not in previous years or the next year. Can somebody clarify what exactly that is? Thank you. Can, can someone, yeah, Mr. Rankin, if you would wait for, yeah, here's a microphone. Yeah, go ahead, if you'd let us know. Um, at the bottom of that, those are um, principal payments on the bond debt, and in the water and sewer district, principal payments on bond debt are not really an expense. They go directly against the liability um, which is not part of the budget, and that's why it's shown as a zero line item for fiscal 21. It's shown in fiscal 20 because that's what you all voted and it was in there. Thank you. My name's Marie Kittle, Randolph, Vermont. Uh, regarding substances and water, I'm interested in hearing more about the PFOAs that might be in the Randolph system. Thank you. Is there someone here who can address that? Mr. Balon? Um, I, I think it, just a bit of a correction. I think the issue may be related to an article in the Herald. Um, uh, we don't have PFOAs in drinking water. Uh, the, the issue is mostly about the processing of leachate from the landfill at the wastewater plant. Um, it's, it's a normal process. We separate the, the sludge from the water. We treat the water before we release it, in, release it into the environment per state regulation. So uh, there is no PFOA in your drinking water. Uh, I just want to be very clear with that. Uh, it's, it's two separate issues. Uh, um, one is PFOAs in a leachate, which is just the dirty water that comes out of the landfill that we process at the wastewater plant and make sure it's clean before we release it into the environment. Thank you for that question. Other questions about water and sewer? Patsy French, and just to follow up to Marie Kittle's question, when the water goes from the sewer plant, it's been cleaned and goes into the White River, are there any PFOAs in the water that goes into the river? Uh, my understanding, uh, I'm not the water superintendent, so I'll try to answer as best as I can. Um, my understanding of the process is no, there, is, there are no PFOAs. We test the water on multiple occasions before we release it, once when we put it into the system, once while it's in the system, and again before it goes out into the, to the environment. So there are multiple testing lo uh, locations. Each one of those uh, tests are shared with the state so they are aware of what we are collecting and then treating, so uh, no, we're not, we're not releasing those. Thank you for that follow-up question. Kelly? One minute, we'll, um, get, we'll get right to you. Thank jo you. Joan Sachs, Randolph Center. I'm confused, um, the leachate, isn't that in the landfill? And that's not near the sewer treatment, am I correct about that? Is there sewer treatment from, from the leachate in the landfill? Isn't that where the PFOAs were? Right. The, the leachate from the landfill is trucked to the wastewater plant to be treated. Uh. Okay. 
Where were you 15 minutes ago? Okay, Chris Recchia, and now I'm confused. I, should, I gotta stop listening to everybody. So, Adolfo, the landfill didn't get a liner in the recent uh, past, did it? I mean, it's got a cap, but it was never a lined landfill, which means the discharge is going to the groundwater. Are we collecting leachate by pumping it out of the ground and putting it in, or is there a portion of the landfill that's lined that I wasn't aware of? Okay, but there's still a portion that is not lined, correct? Yeah. The, the portion that was mentioned in the article in the Herald was about the Lions landfill, and that's where we are collecting the leachate. Okay, thank you, because um, I, I interpreted it as coming from the groundwater wells, and that's where they were measuring it, but you're saying it's from the leachate. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Hi, Cynthia Quilici, uh, Randolph Village. So I wasn't aware of this leachate uh, sort of transfer continuous. Is that something that's just going to go on continuously into the future ad infinitum? And what's really the annual cost of that going forward, do you think? Um, Mr. Bailon, you've been answering these questions can you answer this one? You may, uh, yes. Uh, and you may or may not have. I don't have all the answers. Uh, I, I can mention that um, there is annual testing. The, the state has mandated time frames for when we have to test. So, uh, you know, 20, 30 years. Uh, we do have an annual testing amount budgeted in the, um, in the budget. I'm trying to find it. Maybe Cliff has already found it. Page On page 61. Page 61 under the landfill closure fund, we've got a line item called leachate expenses. And in fiscal 19, which was last spring, um, we had quite a lot of water running through there, and so our leachate expenses went, went up. Um, we generally, uh, we show a liability on the books for monitoring the landfill, which is a 30-year process mandated by the state. We've got 10 years to go in the 30 years. Um, and we don't know what the state is going to do when we get to the end of the 30 years, whether they're going to continue to require an ongoing monitoring, and we're watching that pretty close. Thank you. Maria Puglisi. I think that the costs of the leachate should be covered by the by the revenue that was made initially from having that landfill and having much of Vermont come and bring their their uh, their garbage there, so I'm assuming that's working out evenly. Uh, the landfill closure fund uh, is made up from the revenue that we collected when we had the landfills. There was over $3 million, I believe, originally back in 1997-98, which was invested in a variety of different ways. Some of the money was split up for other different uses, but a large chunk of that was set aside specifically for landfill closure. Um, there was a shift of funds probably, I want to say about seven or eight years ago where we shifted some more funds from what we call the landfill depreciation fund, which basically was uh, excess funds that were being set aside to be determined how we would use them in the future. So there was a shift from, uh, I believe we added another three or 400,000 into the landfill closure. Um, so the, the fund originally was around 300, 400,000. We shifted an additional three or 400,000. I believe the fund now is about 9 million, uh, 900,000. So that um, because there was a change in the number of years that we had to monitor, monitor the landfill. Originally it was 20 years, it shifted now to 30 years. Like Cliff said, we don't know, they may shift it again and make it an, an additional 10 or 20 years. 
So we've been monitoring it. We have shifted funds when we felt that it looked like the need was going to be greater. So there is sufficient funds right now to cover the costs for um, the monitoring right now and for the expenses for uh, you know testing the leachate and whatnot. But you know, like Cliff said, you know, the, the town is monitoring that closely because uh, you know the state has very specific requirements, and so you know we're trying to, to be sure that we adhere to them. We're on <clears throat> Article Eight and Nine. It is 11.15, which is good, that's all right. And um, I think what we're going to do next is take up special appropriations all at once. What we do there typically, and I think it works well, is to have, uh, if there are people who want to speak from one of these organizations, to speak first. Once we're done with special appropriations, I think we should have our raffle. And then we have a lot to tackle from the floor. Are, are, are we on Article 8 and 9, water and sewer? No. OK, hang on. I just want to just make sure we're, we're all, looks like we're all done with Article 8 and 9. So let's go ahead and, and move on with special appropriations. Just. Um, Make sure you state your name. Kelly, I'm Bennett Law, and I, I feel compelled for the first time in over 32 years. Name? Law, L-A-W. Wait, Bennett, are you a Randolph voter? No, that's what I'm here to explain. I'm, I'm sorry, but I uh, feel I need to apologize that I love in, live in uh, lovely Bethel Gilead. If but, there is um, no objection. Hang on, Bennett. <laughs> hang on for one second. If there's no objection, I will let Mr. Law speak. Go ahead, Mr. Law. There's I'm no just objection. here because I do have information about Article 18, which is a new appropriation request this year from the Friends of the Historic Playhouse Theater. Um, that is a nonprofit that was established specifically to support and sustain the Playhouse Theater. Um, I think many of you know who patronize the theater that it sort of ekes out its existence at this point. It makes enough money to cover its operating expenses, but not really money to cover maintenance or any kind of upgrade. And we are confronting some maintenance issues right now. So uh, I just want to remind everyone what a treasure it is to have a movie theater in town. Our, our teenagers, our seniors are not having to drive 30 or 40 miles to go to Montpelier or Hanover or Lebanon to come to a, a movie. I think it's part of uh, the continued downtown revitalization that you have in this community. Uh, Randolph, I don't, I imagine you know this, is sort of blessed to have everything, you know, the hospital, the, the, the Chandler, and it goes on and on and on, and the movie theater is a part of that. So I'm here to encourage you to uh, vote yes on that appropriation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Other uh, people from organizations that might like to speak first on an article before we open it up to just about anyone. Hi, I'm Jennifer Guarino, uh, Randolph Village, and I'd like to speak about the Orange County Restorative Justice Center, which used to be called Orange County Court Diversion. So it's evolved a bit over the last year or so. And its goal really is to provide alternatives, constructive alternatives to the criminal and civil court systems. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, it serves the whole county. And I think up until, uh, up to this year, every town in the county has provided an appropriation for this center. Um, so the, the center is very proud to serve the whole county in this capacity. And in many cases, they um, provide alternatives for people who have kind of come to the end of their options. Uh, it's a very community-based approach. I'm a volunteer for the center. I work with their circles of support and accountability to help uh, ex-prisoners reintegrate back into the community. And I'm also on the reparative uh, justice panel as well. <clears throat> and I can tell you it's a very meaningful um, role for me to play as a volunteer. And I see a lot of um, 
uh, healing that happens uh, on the part of the offender and the people who have been offended. So they're asking for $600 for their appropriation, and I think it's money very well spent. Uh, it's, a, it's a small investment that will make a big difference. So thank you. Thank you so much. Anyone else from an organization that would like a, a chance to speak first? Then let's open it up. Let's open it up generally. Oh, we have two hands here. Right here. Go ahead. No, go go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Martha Hafner. I'm just adding a PS to the comments that have already been said on the restorative justice program. Don't know how many of you are terribly, there are a number of people in this area that are involved as COSA people and, and thank you for all your work that you do because you are an integral part to that. But I wanna also make, make comment because what it's costing us as taxpayers is close to, I don't know why the difference, $70,000 $70, per female who is incarcerated and 55000 for every male that's incarcerated. But with the restorative justice program, those figures are dramatically reduced. And it's reintegrating people with it, making it so that um, the chances of recidivism are much greatly reduced. So. Thank you for all of you that have been COSA volunteers, and this $600 pledge is nothing compared to what the services you're providing. Thank you. Uh, Tamara Morgan, I was going to, um, before you spoke, I was going to say perhaps you should um, ask for more next year, because I do think the work you're doing is amazing, and, and I think it's well worth that little amount, and I think it's worth more. Thank you. Other comments about the special appropriations? I'm Edward Del Hagen Randolph. Um, I'd like to make a comment on Stagecoach. Um, the services that Stagecoach has been providing um, are extremely valuable. Uh, in recent years, there's been a commuter line, a set of commuter lines between here and Montpelier that have been added to the many different routes that they offer. And it's a, a tremendous asset to folks who have to make those long commutes. Um, it's very cost effective. It's a courteous professional service. There's great community of people that ride buses back and forth. And for folks who are worried about things like climate change, there's an opportunity to have a direct impact. So I'd just like to offer my support for Stagecoach. Thank you. I've heard it's super fun. <laughs> yeah. Can I be recognized on... Please, um, of course. Uh, where is it? Article 14, the Clara Martin Center. I'm Kristen Chandler. Um, in my regular job, I work with the mental health emergency crisis teams around the state as well as law enforcement around the state, training them to work together. And we are really lucky here um, in Randolph to have the Clara Martin Center. And I want to make sure everybody's aware that... Um, Every year, one law enforcement officer and one mental health crisis worker get recognized for their collaborative efforts. And this year, uh, a Claire Martin uh, emergency worker nominated uh, an Orange County Sheriff, um, Captain Scott Kluat, for his work here in Randolph um, and around the county in being collaborative. And uh, Captain Kluat won this award. Uh, it's recognized just once a year for one law enforcement officer. So they have a great relationship with the police uh, and with Gifford and working together in, in trying to get people to the best place they can be. So we're lucky to have Claire Martin here. Thank you so much. Hand in the back.
Mary Lewis Webb, um, town of Randolph. I've rode the stagecoach for years down to the VA as a commuter, and it's a wonderful thing. I'm supporting that, and I hope you will. And also, there were times where we um, we would take a spouse of an elderly spouse of a patient who was at Dartmouth Hitchcock, and the um, Dartmouth coach, I mean the stagecoach, would take that. Um, spouse down to um, Dartmouth Medical Center. I'm also a member of the co-op for the movie theater here in town, and I just want to make a pitch um, that, that that is part of the arts, and arts are important for human spirit. They're also a part of the quality of life, and they make life rich and sweet. And to have a movie theater in our town is so important versus those of us who are moviegoers, and I know there are many of us in this town that are because I see you there. Um, we're not having to go to Montpelier or, or up to <laughs> Burlington or um, down to Hanover um, to watch movies. We have movies here, and they're bringing good movies, so I really hope you'll support that. And I was also on the diversion program years ago with Betty Edson, so um, I know with, they have a new name now. It sounds like they do great work. Um, so... Vote yes on them all. Thank you. Special appropriations. If there are no other comments, I'm going to give the floor to Janet Watton, who is, um, it's, it's time for our raffle. And, and we always have time for that. <laughs> and it's also time once a year to thank all of you guys. You own this space. It's your hall. And we continue to be grateful for the uh, community for in 2000, I think it was nine, appropriating us a big chunk of money so that we could make this place more uh, comfortable for people, uh, more accessible and give ourselves a little bit more room backstage so we're not all so cramped. So we are delighted to have you come here once a year for me to tell you that. Uh, this is not actually a raffle. Um, I'm, we used to put numbers under oh. your seats, but this oh. time I, I have randomly, and this is going to be a problem probably, randomly <laughs> chosen A, plop, plop, and D, 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 so, and if you are sitting, so notice where you are sitting, and, um, I will call out a seat number, and if you are in it, voila, you get tickets. So seats, seats are numbered 1 through 9, and then it starts 10 through, I think, 19, right? And then 20 to 27 or 8 or so, all right? So you need to know your numbers. You need to know your alphabet. We start at A down here. It goes B, C, D, and so forth. A lot of you can probably see your number by looking at the seat in front of you. Right. And I'm going to have to make up the last one because there's nobody in the balcony this year. All right. The first lucky winner is A6. And, and if we don't have it exactly, we'll go closest to. Yeah, A6. Closest. Who's sitting closest to A6? Yeah! That's awesome. And then we have C15. Woohoo! Nice work. F is in Frank 20. All right. I 14. Yeah. All right. D is in dog. Nine. Yeah. Tamara does win every year. Tam that, that's, that's incredible. J, five. All right. Anything, yeah. 
H13. Lucky number 13. K20. Compromises this time. C twenty two. All right. Go select board. And now off the top of my head, um, M twelve. Yay. <laughs> playing our game and please open up your envelope, figure out what to do and come and see some of our wonderful, wonderful shows. Thank you. Uh, before we, is Paul Ray here? No. Oh, I just want to give him a sh shout out in absentee. You see that the town report is dedicated to him and he's, he's an amazing person who's been working really hard. You can, you can read about him on the inside cover. Um, he's, uh, he's, he's one of many, many, many volunteers who um, keep, keeps our town running. So, all right, Article 27 is to hear and act upon any reports of the town officers and committees. Now, the town officers and committees have supplied in the town report many, many, uh, many, many reports. And so I ask, um, do any town offices or committees seek to supplement the reports that we already all have in the town report? Okay, so there are no, no one's supplementing their reports. So if there are no objections, I will accept the various reports of the officers and committees and move on to the next article. I have a question, Steve Webster from the, the village. Uh, I have a question to the trustees of public funds. Near the bottom of page 34, um, in the middle column, it shows um, that the Grant Park Veterans Memorial, uh, the value of the um, fund went down about a quarter, 25%, and the Playground Village also went, oh, disappeared. So I'm curious about those changes. Thank you, I wonder, can, is, is, there a, is there a trustee of public funds here? Mr. Rankin, can you address that question? I can. Is it on? Okay. Um, part of the reason for that, Steve, is a, a lack of transfer of funds over the years, and so that was caught up during fiscal 19, which is why you show the decline. Those funds owed money to the town. Short and succinct, the way we like it. Thank, thank you for that question, and I should actually ask if there are questions about any of those reports. This is, this is the time to, ask, to, talk, to ask them. I just want to say thank you to our town officers. Every time we go in for whatever we are going in for, we always have a wonderful experience. So I just, I don't know when the appropriate time is to do that, but I really want to thank you. No time like the present. Uh, Marty Strange, I live on Pleasant Street. Um, I see that uh, in the capital improvement plan, there's um, once again um, long overdue plans to uh, invest in improvements in Maple Street, long overdue. And uh, I'm glad to see it. But it's, I wonder if the select board has a plan for dealing with it, has apparently been a problem for a long time with Maple Street, and that the right of way that the town has there is not adequate to do the improvements up to current engineering standards and legal standards. There's been talk from time to time about turning it into a one-way street and maybe doing the same thing with Highland going the other way. 
I mean, I suppose there are other solutions. You can, you can take property from adjacent owners, or you can build something that's illegal. Um, I hope the third choice is not one of the ones that we're going to take. So I'm wondering what the plan is if we vote this money, is it going to be used? I was on the Capital Budget Planning Committee for 10 years, and we always had Maple Street in the budget, and it always kept getting pushed back another year because this problem couldn't be solved. So I'm wondering what the plan is now. Mr. Milan. I, I can mention that uh, Mr. Strange is correct. This project has been in discussion for, for some time. Um, the issue of it being one way versus two ways is also uh, it's an issue. Uh, the select board asked that we perform a traffic study because we, uh, the select board wanted to make sure it heard from residents on Highland Avenue and the neighboring communities that may potentially be affected if Maple Street were to become one way. Um, so before we got to that point, we had to perform a traffic study, uh, which we have received since, um, um, and the traffic study wasn't necessarily, I'll just say it wasn't driving with what we were hearing from residents on Maple Street. Um, so now we're left with a traffic study performed by a regional planning commission. They stand by the traffic study. We have comments made by residents on Maple Street, which do not necessarily, you know, uh, connect very well with, with the facts as presented by a regional planning commission. So what's next to do is to hold community meetings with folks on Maple Street, folks on Highland Street, to make sure that if a plan is pulled together that the community decides what the plan is so they are all aware that it will either be one way or two way, that it will affect Highland Avenue, may affect Fairview. Um, everyone's gonna know where we are as we're moving forward as opposed to just the town pulling a, uh, you know, a fast one putting new concrete on the road and putting new lines on, uh, on the concrete. So we do have public meetings planned. We will share the data with uh, the residents that choose to attend the meeting. Again, we could, the only thing we can do is promise to hold the meeting, promise to invite you to the meeting. We can't force you to come, but we would like for you to come if you live in the neighborhood once we have the public meetings and once we notice them. Thanks so much. Um, it would probably will have some, some rules and some formats. The folks that would be directly affected would probably have the initial say, similar to town meeting, where everyone has uh, the ability to ask a question, make a comment, and then we maybe spread out at that point, knowing that it affects everyone. We're all uh, resident of the town, but we want to make sure that the folks that are directly involved, directly feel affected by this change, will have a say, and then everyone else will also have a say. All right, so then, if there are no objections, I will, on behalf of the town here, accept the various reports of the officers and committees. And we will move on to Article 28. Thank you so much. Okay, Article 28 has to do with the Budget Committee, and I'm going to read it to you. It's long, but many of you haven't read it until just now, and so I think it's important that I read it out loud to you. I might even have to do that, so <laughs> some of them I don't read. But we're gonna be voting on this one, and it, or not, depending on what you choose to do. So I will read to you Article 28. Shall the town voters authorize the following changes to the budget committee henceforth? Then there are 10 changes listed. The budget committee shall consist of five legal, legal voters of the town of Randolph, none of whom are serving on the select board or are employees of the town. Two members of the budget committee will be elected annually at town meeting for a term of two years and a term of three years. The committee shall, at its first meeting following town elections, elect from its membership a committee chairman, a secretary, and whatever other offices a majority of the committee members feel are necessary. Committee officers shall serve until the next town meeting and shall be eligible for re-election to subsequent terms. 
The committee shall also, at its first town meeting, uh, at its first meeting following town meeting, establish its rules of procedure for the coming year. Should a committee vacancy occur, the select board shall appoint to membership on the committee any legal voter of the town who is willing and qualified to serve and who is neither a member of the select board nor an employee of the town. The newly appointed member shall serve on the committee until the next town meeting. One member of the select board shall be appointed annually to be the liaison between the select board and the budget committee. The appointed liaison is not a member of the budget committee but is charged with keeping the committee and the select board informed of the deliber deliberations and activities of both groups. The budget committee will receive monthly reports on current budgets and spending from the town director of finance and will request and receive from the director of finance and or the town manager any other reports or financial records that the committee deems necessary. Annually, the committee will receive the proposed town budget from the town director of finance, will review it, and will report its findings and or recommendations to the select board. The budget committee will meet with the town director of finance throughout the year to review current and proposed budgets, such meetings to occur no less than quarterly. The budget committee will report to the select board as it deems necessary or as requested by the select board. Is there any motion? We have a motion here. Sally Penrod, I move that we accept this as written. Okay, so I, I I'm hearing you say that you, uh, you move to authorize the following 10 listed changes. Okay, is there a second? Joan Sachs, I second. Okay. It's been moved and seconded that the voters authorize the 10 listed changes that I'm not going to read to you again right now. We're gonna just refer to them as the 10 listed changes. It's uh, the, the article is now on the floor. If there's anyone who would like to um, comment or speak about the article. Holly Sanders uh, from Randolph Center. Uh, do we know what, uh, at what point these two new members will be elected? Because in the budget, we have one person listed in this report. Do we have a separate election for that? And when will that take place? I, if this motion passes. So first of all, there is presently a vacancy that um, the, this group can fill if it chooses. Uh, and then there will be, if, if this article passes, Today, this group can then fill those two additional vacancies. Today, if you, it chooses. You mean the group can nominate somebody to f people to fill those vacancies? Today, yes. So again, there is presently a vacancy. You're very used to that. We do this every year. There's always a vacancy on the budget committee, and we always vote. Um, so we can we will do that today if you choose. And then, if this article passes, there will be two additional seats that need to be filled, and you may take that. You can fill those today if you like. But it is your meeting, and you don't have to do any of this. That's the recognized? truth. Um, Kristen Chandler, I believe there are a couple members of the Budget Committee currently present here today. If you could just explain um, for everybody the need to expand the Budget Committee from three to five. Michael Penrod again. Um, Mr. Penrod, would you um, really speak up on that microphone? Now can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> okay, I've been on the budget committee, oh God, more than 10 years, I believe. And it is, has always been three, and it's become more and more difficult because a quorum is two, so two of us can't talk because of the open meeting laws. And we felt that we needed more of a representation 
of uh, people in the town because this is such an important committee. It's the only committee that represents the taxpayers, that is elected by the taxpayers, that advises the select board and their takeaway on the, the current and proposed budgets. The budget committee looks at the current status of the taxes on a, on a monthly basis. Cliff sends out a, a report. We can ask questions on that. So we really keep an eye on the budget throughout the year, and then we assist the uh, town manager and the um, financial director to prepare the budget that is uh, given to the select board. So we are an advisory committee. We can't pass laws. We can't, we, we can just talk to you as taxpayers, but I think it's very important. And the five is really the driving force of the changes that we're suggesting in this to this make it more efficient and uh, more viable. Hope you support it. Thank you, Mr. Penrod. Is there other discussion of Article 28? Yep. Okay. Thanks, Kristen. Patsy French, and I apologize, this is a really nitpicky question, but in some sentences it says shall and some say will. Is it the intent that they have the same meaning? Thank you. She should have been a lawyer. <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> Don't do that to yourself. <laughs> Other remarks or discussion about Article 28? I'm not seeing any hands, but I'm just gonna give you a second here to just think if you want to say something before we move on to the vote. All right, it looks like you are ready for the question. The question is, shall the voters authorize the 10 listed changes to the budget committee. And when I say the 10 listed changes, I mean those right here in the warning as written. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes clearly have it and the article is adopted. Whew, I was like up all night worried. <laughs> Now, now, now it gets, um, you know, fun. So um, Article 29 is to elect and fill any vacancies on the budget committee. And so um, the first thing that we're going to do, so that now we have three vacancies. And so the first thing that I'm going to do is um, I am going to alert uh, Jessamyn West, Ruth Lutz, and Pat French that I might need your services to help count votes, but we might not. But so just don't leave the room <laughs> for a minute <laughs> while we do this. Okay, so there are now three vacancies on the budget committee. There is the regular one that we, um, that, that is vacant. And um, Mr. Penrod, maybe you know, do, how, what, what um, length of term is the, is the vacancy that we've had all along? The current vacancy. The the current vacancy is three years. Okay. And tell, tell me about the uh, other two vacancies. Okay. One is for how long? 
One is for two years. Well, no, no, you don't have to do it. So one is for okay. two years and one is one, for one, one year. Is, one is for three years, one is for two years, and one is for one year. And okay. this one-year term will become a two-year term at the uh, 2021 town meeting. Okay, all right. So the first vacancy that we're going to fill is for the three-year term. Um, and if, if you choose to do that. But... Uh, I'd like to open the floor then to nominations for that three-year term on the Budget Committee. I'm Sally Penrod. I nominate Jerry Ward. He's not here, but I know he's willing. Okay, did everyone hear that? Jerry Ward has been nominated, and he is not here, but you have spoken to him, and he is w willing. Unfortunately, Jerry is stuck in Costa Rica. <laughs> but I do have an email from him stating that he would be very happy to be a member of the Budget Committee. I second the motion. Are there other not, we don't even actually need a second, but are there other nominees for the three-year position? Okay, it appears that there are not any uh, other nominations for that three-year position. And so Mr. Ward is running from Costa Rica, <laughs> unopposed. <laughs> this might be why he is running for the three-year position. <laughs> um, so uh, I think that we can handle this with a voice vote, frankly. Um, so, uh, let's do that. Um, I'm going to ask you to vote uh, now. Uh, all those in favor of Jerry Ward getting the three-year position on the Budget Committee uh, say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes have it, and Mr. Ward is now uh, on the Budget Committee for three years. Let's take up the, the two-year spot now. There is now a new position, it's two years long, and let's open the floor to nominations if you would like to do that. You got this all planned out. That's good. I like when someone has a plan. For two years, I nominate Tamara Morgan. Okay. Tamara Morgan is here, sitting over there. Ms. Morgan, um, would you like to speak? You don't have to. Hi, all. Um, <laughs> I'm currently a trustee of the board of the library. Um, I've been here for 20 years. Um, I'm perfectly happy to sit on the budget committee because I know that... Um, Volunteering for town is very important, and the budget committee as an advisory committee is very important. Um, and I'm happy to be nominated and serve. Thank you. I, I'd like to recognize Joyce next. I don't want to create problems, but oh, no. part of the article that we just passed said that the individual would not be an employee of the town or, um, and even though she's not technically an employee. She's an elected official serving for, as a library trustee for the town of Randolph. So I don't know if that creates a conflict or not. I just want to point that out. Thank you. Is there other discussion? Actually, are there other nominations? Let's get that first. All right, there are no, it doesn't appear that there are other nominations. Does any, would anyone like to say anything? I am not your attorney. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you hit someone with a baseball bat. I just want, okay, is there an attorney in the room 
who can adjust that, address this question? Uh, no attorney worth their <laughs> weight in salt would do that. <laughs> but, you know, the Article 28, which you just passed, says two members of the Budget Committee will be elected, I'm sorry, See, this is why you don't want to ask me, but it says the budget committee shall consist of five legal voters of the town of Randolph, none of whom are serving on the select board or are employees of the town. The only um, potential conflict would be in Tamara's any oversight on the library's budget itself. Uh, the rest of it would be, it would seem to be independent. So, um, uh. Thank you. Uh, we're going to, I saw a hand up. Anybody else? No? Nope, you've changed your mind. There's a hand uh, over here in the back. Peggy Whiteneck, East Randolph. Uh, my understanding of the term employee is that it's a paid position. Are the trustees for the library paid? No. So it seems to me that's a moot point. I have a comment. Uh, just would ask Ms. Morgan if she'd be willing to recuse herself in any budgetary matters that affect the library. If you were to serve on the budget committee. Okay. Is there other discussion? I would just like to point out that this is an advisory committee. It can advise the select board, can't pass laws, can't pass ordinances or anything else. The only power that we have is to, which happened once many, many years ago when the uh, budget committee disagreed with the select board and ran a column in the Herald, and the budget didn't pass that year. That's the only authority that, that the budget has. <laughs> Other discussion? Okay. So, um, Ms. Morgan is running for the two-year position, unopposed, uh, two-year position on the budget committee. And so I'm going to ask you to vote on that now. All those in favor of Ms. Morgan taking that seat, say aye. aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes have it. And Ms. Morgan is elected to the Budget Committee for two years. There's one more position that you may fill if you would like, and it is a one-year position. And um, I see a, it's just a, a <laughs> voter. Is there, are, are there nominations? Oh, yes. Hello, my name is Rachel Putney, and I am, I guess, nominating myself or asking for someone to nominate me for the one-year position on the Budget Committee. I'm currently a Randolph resident. I was born and raised here and I'm currently doing master's education courses for public administration certification. Thank you. Oh boy. Thank you, Ms. Putney. Are there other nominations? Let's... No. Thanks. Tom Ayers, Brook Street, and um, presuming that Rachel, if she could not nominate herself, I would wholeheartedly uh, nominate her. <laughs> yep. No All right. She, are there other nominations for other candidates? Other nominations? I'm not seeing any hands. All right, would you like to discuss this or shall we vote? 
All right, so um, Ms. Putney's running for the one-year seat on the Budget Committee. All those in favor of her being elected to that position say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes have it, and Ms. Putney is uh, now on the Budget Committee. <laughs> We're moving right along. Thank you all. <clears throat> Article 30 is to fill any other vacancy. Now there are many, many, many vacancies um, in all kinds of committees. Um, we require a lot of volunteers who put in a lot of time to the town. The select board appoints many of, um, many of those positions and you should all apply. Holly Sanders. Uh Chair of the Capital Budget Committee. We have one vacancy on our committee um, that has been vacant for a long, long time. It's a one-year appointment. And it's very helpful for the same reason Mr. Penroff mentioned about having enough people to come to a meeting. If somebody can't make a meeting, we can't have a quorum, and therefore we can't conduct any business. Um, we would like to have somebody come on our committee um, it doesn't, ha you don't have to decide right now. It can be, you can talk to the select board or the town manager and they would be happy to have you fill that position if you're interested. Um, the purpose of our committee is to review the capital expenses of the town. And this is a budget that we work on for five years looking forward. So we're not only talking about what you do next year, we're talking about what you do for the next five years in an attempt to keep the expenditures of the town level so that we're not having high tax rates one year and low tax rates another year. So we're looking for a person who would like to fill that position and join us on the committee. We meet about six times a year, mostly in November and December, and um, with one meeting in the summertime. Generally, uh, it's a very short meeting. It's an hour long each time, and we review the capital budget as proposed by the select board and the town manager. Thank you. Thank you so much. Kelly, can I speak? Yes. Um, so I'm Kristen Gage. I live on Fish Hill, and I heeded the call last year at town meeting when there was a desperate plea for committee members, and it's really been great. Um, if it's not something that you've considered doing, I joined the rec committee, yes. um, and the rec committee is doing some really fun stuff. Yeah. Um, the but rec I, I would say that joining a committee in general, you're going to meet your neighbors, you're going to be involved, people are going to stop you on the street and want to talk about cool things. Um, it really is an important way to serve the town. We show up for town meeting, but there's so much more we could be doing throughout the year, and it's not an enormous time commitment. Um, so. Just consider it, um, especially for younger people. It's a great way um, to integrate yourself. So. Thank you so much. The rec committee is really amazing right now. We are really doing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. All right. Article 31. Article 31 reads, shall the town voters authorize the select board to borrow money up to, but not exceeding the anticipated tax and bond slash grant revenue for the ensuing year? Is there a motion? Thank you, Mr. Webster. Thank you, Ms. Hafner. Article 31 has been moved and seconded, and uh, is there discussion? I'd like to say thank you to whoever edited Article 31 down to its concise meaning. Who did that? Thank you, that's genius. <laughs> Really? I think we should read the old version now. No. <laughs> I hate it. This is all that needs to be said.
Anyone have any actual discussion? Are you ready for the question? You look ready for the question. Okay, the question is, shall the town voters authorize the select board to borrow money up to, but not exceeding, the anticipated tax and bond slash grant revenue for the ensuing year? All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes have it, and Article 31 is adopted. Thank you. Article 32. Um, I'm going to read to you Article 32. Article 32 says, whereas extreme and erratic temperatures, increasingly severe storms, arise in tick-borne diseases and threats to farmers and maple sugar makers clearly demonstrate that climate change is one of the most urgent problems facing our state, nation, and the world, and whereas the state of Vermont has a goal in the comprehensive energy plan to achieve 90% of its energy from renewable sources by 2050, yet is making insufficient progress towards achieving that goal. Now, therefore, be it resolved, number one, the undersigned voters of the town of Randolph urge the state of Vermont to halt any new or expanded fossil fuel infrastructure commit to 100% renewable energy for all new infrastructure and energy uses by 2030 within Vermont with firm inter interim milestones. Ensure, B, ensure that the transition to renewable energy is fair and equitable for all residents with no harm to marginalized groups or rural communities. Number two. The undersigned, voter, undersigned voters of the town of Randolph urge the town and its officials to do its part to meet these recommendations and those within the town plan by committing to efforts such as A, protecting town properties from fossil fuel infrastructure, denying easements or agreements from any pipelines crossing town properties, B, weatherizing town buildings and schools and other initiatives to improve residents' quality of life while helping conserve current resources and reduce overall energy use. C, enlisting state support to install solar power on town and school properties. D, encourage landowners, municipalities, and farmers to implement practices that build healthy soil, which increases carbon storage to cool the planet and mitigate flooding and drought. E, support the recommendations from town commissions and committees relating to climate mitigation and prepare an energy efficiency action plan aimed at reducing town use of fossil fuels. Should this article pass, a letter shall be sent from the town of Randolph to our state representatives and senators, the Speaker of the House, Vermont House, the President pro tempore of the Vermont Senate, and the Governor. Is there a motion? Mrs. Sachs? I don't second. Is there a second? Is that Marjorie Ryerson? Marjorie Ryerson has seconded the article. So I will not read it a second time, but it is it, the article is is moved and seconded. And um, it's a long article. Um, I think what the article requires is for the select board to send a letter to our state representatives and the other people urging the state um, to do the first uh, three items you see under one, one A and B, and uh, requires the town and its officials um, to do its part to meet the recommendations of the state's comprehensive energy plan and our own town plan by committing to projects such as the, the ones listed. 
Uh, is there discussion? Okay, let's see. Uh, Shannon Hance, Randolph, um, Randolph resident. Um, I was just wondering who is going to prepare an energy efficiency action plan? Um, it's just not clear who's, who will be responsible for that. So just wanted to put that out there. Is there someone, um, yeah, thank you. Is there someone who um, helped draft the article that would like to speak generally about the article first? If you would please state your name. John Pemitol, East Randolph. Uh, to answer your question directly, there is an energy committee here in Randolph who would, who would be part of that. Um, this resolution was placed here for discussion by a group of folks from all over town who gathered about 225 signatures on a petition. Active in that group gathering signatures were students from Randolph High School who are also here today and would like to speak to you about this resolution as well. 55 other towns in Vermont have already passed a similar resolution to date. Even here in Randolph, we have begun to see impacts of climate change, and eventually it will affect every part of our lives. I could go on and talk about the, the, the different sections, but I think Kelly has already talked about those in, in detail, and if there are further questions, we can answer them. But in general, not recognizing the dangers of climate change and not taking action to reduce it, and not taking action to mitigate it, will leave our younger generations a world with few of the opportunities and none of the possibilities that each of us have had growing up. So I urge you all to pass this resolution. Um, get this on, on the town's agenda for discussions, and you know, by burying our heads in the sand about climate change, we're not gonna solve anything. By, 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 head, uh, by me meeting this head on, addressing things as they come up and talking about it, we can come to a, a, a solid plan to mitigate the effects of climate change here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, good afternoon again. Chris Recchia from Teacher Hill Road. Um, Bear with me for a minute, because a couple of different points. One is that uh, I was with the Agency of Natural Resources when in 2011, for the first time, we did the 90% renewable uh, goal by 2050. And uh, then was commissioner of the Public Service Department when it was renewed five years later and really concentrated on addressing the areas that we were unsuccessful so far at addressing. As you probably all know, we have pretty high level of renewables associated with electricity, but not in thermal, not in home heating, not in weatherization, and not in transportation. And I think that is because we were effective at being able to regulate the utilities to go in this direction. But obviously, we don't regulate your individual homes, and nor would you want us to. So point number one is we have a lot of work to do in weatherization and transportation, and this is really important. Point number two, I, I, in terms of the need for this, I think I like using this, uh, this analogy or metaphor, so bear with me. If you, we look, up, we look up in the sky and we think that the atmosphere is unlimited because we don't see any boundary to it. So I wanna take you for a second. Put Vermont on its edge. So we got the Massachusetts border up to Canada. That is the full thickness of, you are in outer space if you go that 270 miles or whatever up there. But the breathable atmosphere and, the, and half the atmosphere would be between the Massachusetts border and Putney. So it's really important to realize we've got about 12 miles of air that encompasses really all of, or most of what we're talking about here. It's not unlimited. And the thought that you could take 100 million years worth of carbon from all the plant debris that caused the formation of coal and stick that into that thin atmosphere in 150 years and not have there be an effect is the real fundamental problem in our thinking. Now, we're the big brain people. Uh, well, we're the people. We're the big brain animals on Earth, and we should be able to deal with this. 
Um, the last thing I want to say is that um, even though this is a, is a non-binding resolution to the town and then to the state, I can't emphasize enough the need to incorporate your individual action here. The state cannot do this. We, we can't do, the state cannot do what you are asking it to accomplish without you doing everything you can. So what it means really, when I read this resolution, is within 10 years, you all need to be carbon neutral. How are you gonna do it? Think about it, work on it. Um, I do support the resolution because I think that we need to start paying much more attention to this and our leaders need to do more, but we as individuals are the ones who need to make this change. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, hello, I am Ilya Andreev. Uh, I live in Brookfield. I am ineligible to vote and I am asking permission to speak. Uh, if there's no objection, I will give you permission to speak. Do you, do you attend the high school? Uh, yes. Would you stand? Yeah, go ahead. All right. Could you spell your name, please? Um, I-L-Y-A. Is that enough? Thank you. Um, first of all, I would like to thank all of you for everybody who's already been showing support for this movement. Um, it really means a lot to us um, over at the Climate Inequality PBL where we all um, group together, the students. Um, first of all, yes, uh, right, uh, PBL stands for Project Placed Learning um, and we're a group that's, we're a group of students that are trying to, you know, solve the problems of climate change here in Randolph. Um, your children, grandchildren, and family are all growing up in a world that needs you to take action and take a part in this movement. We all want Earth to be a safe place for our future generations, and we need to start somewhere, and Randolph is a start, all of it can be, with your vote. Uh, you have all lived through some of America's toughest times and we are pleading you to not throw that away, to support us in our movement to create a better future for the next generations to come. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there further discussion? Uh, I'd like to speak with you today both as a resident and then also as an employee of the select board vis-a-vis -vis your, your public servant. Um, people over the, over the last two and a half years have come to me and have presented proposals, things they'd like to do, and we typically try to help as much as we can to make them happen, especially if they're things that the town can help with. Um, there are a number of instances we could talk later about those, uh, but in this case, I also want to point out that your tax dollars pay me to ensure that we try to steer the town clear of any trouble that, that could be coming because of something that happens through a vote or through a contract. Um, although I, I applaud the, the efforts of the committee, I just want to ask if they would be willing to potentially table this so that we could work on the language that's not committing the town to do something that could be violating the, the land use regulations or is very vague in what it's directing the town to do. For example, um, encouraging landowners. That, you know, how, how would do we encourage them? Um, we don't want there to be any any avenue for a landowner to say, well, I didn't really feel encouraged. Someone told me to do something, but I didn't feel encouraged. So if, if we worked on the language that made it very specific on certain points, well, for example, uh, A, it says that the town is, the voters here today are directing the town to not approve certain type of projects. Well, if the land use regulations allow certain type of projects in certain areas, we wouldn't rightfully say to a property owner or a business, no, you can't do this you know, because our land use regulations say you can. So that could potentially create a legal issue where a landowner or a property owner or a business owner can sue the town. So I'm not saying that, um, that this isn't a, a good uh, proposal for you to consider. I'm just saying I'd, I'd love to help by making the changes necessary so that it'd be specific so that the town doesn't get into trouble um, in trying to help 
uh, this, 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 you know, I think to pass. Mr. Malan, are you making a motion to postpone this uh, conversation, this article? Uh, as, as a town resident, I, I understand I have th that authority, but this is your meeting. I'm here as your employee. So I'm not going to make that motion, and I will leave it to the voters to decide. I just want to make sure that you can make the best decision with all the, the, the available information. Thank you. We'll get to every pan. Don't worry about that, for sure. Yeah, hi. Uh, Jeff Tevis Randolph. Um, I would like to make that motion. Um, I think it is dangerously vague and um, puts serious limitations on the town that uh, we shouldn't do at this time. Okay, um, could you, would you just tell us your name again? Jeff Tevis. Jeff Tevis. Thank you. So, Mr. Tevis has made a motion to postpone discussing or taking any action on Article 32. Uh, is there a second? And Mr. Hafner has seconded that. Um, this motion is debatable. It can be discussed by the group. Discussion on uh, postponing indefinitely an article can also include um, debate, actually, about the merits of the motion itself. So is there discussion or debate about the motion now before you, which is to postpone indefinitely, um, you know, postpone um, this article? If we could, let's, uh, okay. Christian Chandler's gonna help me out here for sure. You guys are on it. Go ahead. Uh, I'm Patsy French, and I would oppose postponing this. I think we've been postponing action on climate change for far, far too long. And I would remind people that this is only advisory to the town. This is not in any way an ordinance or anything that someone could sue the town over or the town could get in any trouble for. It is totally advisory. Now, I have great interest in this because I have an adorable four-year-old granddaughter and an adorable two weeks and three days old grandson, as well as a niece and nephew who are 13 and 10, and I want them to have a world to live in. And if we keep postponing and postponing, even to tweak language, for heaven's sake, we're not going to get anywhere. And so I really, really urge people to vote this down. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Aiden Wright. I'm uneligible, uneligible to vote right now. I'm from Brookfield. May I speak? Um, if there is no objection, we will let you speak. Hi, folks. <laughs> uh, I'm a part of the Environmental Inequality PBL, same as my friend Elia here. Do you and attend uh, the local high school? I do. Okay. I'm a junior. I, uh, I'm not going to read off this. I heavily think you all should support this action, this advisory, because this is your future. This is our future. I love Vermont. It's a beautiful place. I've been all over this country and I've never seen any place that has the green hills, that perfect snow. <laughs> Well, perfect and annoying, but still. And I want to keep that. I want my, my children to see that. I want your grandchildren to see that. I really care about the environment. I really care about Vermont. And I think that if you guys all really do care about Vermont, please support this bill. Or advisory. <laughs> I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Um, I don't think that we 
10 cannot be interrupted. We're going to take further discussion? Yes, further I think discussion. we're going to take further discussion on whether to postpone indefinitely the article. So I hope so. Yes. My name's David White, resident of Randolph. I was just going to say something similar to Patsy, that the way I read the Article 33 is that it's non-binding. It uses the word urge, not require. So all of the concerns I've heard expressed against Article 33 so far, I don't think are credible. Thank you. Thank you. We will, we will thank you. We've got more folks. Chris, go ahead. I'm Robin Russell from Randall Center. Um, I'm just wondering to um, the point of the language and um, maybe the authority, of, are, are we granting authority to the Energy Committee to be the representative of the town in drafting this letter? Um, and if John might be able to speak a little bit to um, mentioned other towns of what other towns have, are there examples of what's in those um, urging? <laughs> urging language, thank you. So the way, the way the, I can actually answer some of that. The way the article is drafted is, is, is that it says the town um, should send a letter, should, should be the one sending the letter. And speaking with Mr. Pimenthal about the article, uh, it was his intention that that come from the select board. Um, maybe the town manager would help write it, but, but that was his intention. Um, The point of information is well taken. And um, Ms. Gage, thank you. Yeah, uh, my name's Ken Hafner. Um, I've had a career over the last 40 years or so of working to promote uh, conservation of natural resources and protection of our, our planet. Um, I see in the article we're talking that state already has a plan to deal with this by 2050. Which talking about encouraging folks to do this by 2030. Um, that's 10 years from now. Um, how many folks here um, plan on replacing their furnaces within the next 10 years to something that doesn't use fossil fuels? Um, a few, okay. Uh, a lot of us have, or have put in solar panels. We have done that at our home. Uh, as was previously stated, we're doing real well in that area. Um, I think we need to postpone this decision until uh, we, we have a chance to look at, see what's out there that's available to us, um, that's affordable to us to be able to reach these goals. Um, that's why I think that the 2050 is a more realistic goal. 2030, it, it sounds great, but I just don't think we're going to be able to do it. Thank you. Uh, I've just, what, I'm, what we're going to do here is we're going to alternate um, between the two Kristens picking, picking speakers. Was, um, what, what, the question is, what are we voting on right the now? Mo thank you. The motion before you is whether we should uh, postpone taking up the article. Correct. Yep. Yep. So, Kristen Chandler, do you have a speaker for me? Okay. Hi, Emily Lewis, um, and I have a question on this this part. As I read it, I also, as some people have stated, I read it as that it is not binding; it is simply urging. However, what would be what would be the next step to encourage the town to go through and actually come up with specific ways to change either town language or to um, make this a reality rather than just an urging by the members of the by the community. Thank you for your, your comment. 
the, the article certainly doesn't address that next step. Um, Chris Engage, go ahead, choose a, you got it, thank you. Uh, Tamara Morgan, um, I'd just like to point out um, to Mr. Hafner's uh, point about it being 10 years from now, is the, com the commitment to 100% renewable energy for all new infrastructure and energy use by 2030. That does not mean we all have to replace our furnaces by 2030. Um, it means that any new infrastructure going in from the state needs to be energy efficient, which it should already be, in my opinion. Thank you. Each, each person gets to speak twice, but only before everyone else has had an opportunity to speak. So sorry. <laughs> uh, Camden Walters, Randolph Center. I'm on the planning commission, been on there for a couple years, where we actually do have to deal with concerns, rigorous concerns over language the shalls or the urging and all that kind of stuff, which does have uh, real world um, legal consequences. Here, this, all these questions over, over language and nitpicking, whether we're urging or 10 years or 20 years or whatever, it's completely irrelevant to the situation here and what we should be considering because as other people have pointed out, this is all just kind of an, um, like an advisory kind of thing, a non-binding non thing. I think the main thing that, the, that this kind of uh, uh, work here accomplishes is adding Randolph's name to this growing list of towns and municipalities and groups to slowly, gradually, you know, it's taken forever, but slowly, you know, putting pressure and showing people and leadership that there is more support for this and work on these fronts needs to be done. So to you know, waste a bunch of time here waffling, talking about language and oh, are we going to set up a task force or you know, all this kind of stuff is completely irrelevant and it's just uh, obstructionist basically. So we should, we should just pass this. It's ridiculous. Thank you. Hi, my name is Loretta Thomas. I live in Randolph. And I think that putting a, um, a halt to this, uh, postponing it indefinitely, is terribly wrong. I think some of the things that are needed is to help the landowners, business people, um, to see if there's help available for this town, in this town, to help each other to, to reach these goals. You know, I mean, renewable energy has been on, they've been talking about it for what, 30 years? And not much has been done. You know, and it'll kill us all eventually. You know, um, I'd rather go out another way, let's put it that way, <laughs> you know? <laughs> But I think it is so important for the earth, for the people, for the next generations to continue with this and plan to discuss it, you know, not to postpone it indefinitely. You know, it is just written to start the ball rolling and not wait another 10 years. Look how much has changed in the last 10. Thank you. Hi there, uh, Miles Hooper, Route 12 North. Um, yeah, I think we should just go ahead and vote on the, uh, on the motion that's at hand so we can put that to bed and we can vote on the real motion which is to uh, adopt Article 32. Thank you. Okay, I, I, I see one more hand here. I know that we're, we're letting you know folks speak, but we also want to move things along. But go ahead. Uh, Tom Ayers, Brook Street, and um, I know that sometimes it is the easiest thing to do to uh, parse words and to kick cans down the road and postpone difficult decisions. But this is a can that's been kicked down the road for far too long already. And in that regard, it is a non-binding resolution. It simply sets 
uh, a template for further public action on the critical issue of climate change for the town. And um, the only word that kind of mandates anything in the resolution is the word shall write a letter to our state officials. All that needs to be stated in that letter is the will of the people of Randolph. There's nothing in it that's legally binding. And I think we should put aside this issue of postponing, vote on it now, and get to the topic at hand, which is protecting our environment for all of our futures. Okay, thank you. So the motion on the floor is whether to postpone taking up Article 32. I'm just sort of testing the temperature of the room to see if you want to go forward with that vote. Um, postponing the article would mean that we would move on to the next article. Um, you know, refusing to postpone it would mean that we would then actually have an opportunity for more speakers to talk about Article 32 before we vote on it. So um, we'll see if there are any more comments here about whether, uh, about regarding postponing indefinitely. Um, first, Ms. Sanders, I think you've spoken already, and so we're going to see if there's any, there are any new speakers. Anybody who hasn't had a chance to speak. Mr. French. Thank you. Um, Pat French, I think I'm the only residing selectman here today. Maybe I'm wrong, but we usually set up front. So I'm not speaking for everybody on the select board, but speaking for myself, I would like to deal with this issue. Many people have said that we've waited way too long. I agree with that. I think we can come up with something if the select board wants to do that based on this uh, vote. I think we can come up with something that's strongly worded and would tell our representatives and our state officials that we want to go forward and make some progress, if that's what people vote. Okay. So, I'm not seeing additional hands at this time. And I think that you are ready for the question. The question before you is um, whether the voters um, shall postpone indefinitely any further discussion of Article 2. Oh, sorry, Article 32. Um, voting yes will cut off debate, and we will move on to Article 33, right? So the question before you is whether the voters shall postpone indefinitely the uh, discussion of Article 32. So voting yes will um, we'll end this conversation now, and we'll move on to Article 33. Voting no will put the main motion, Article 32, back on the floor for discussion. So. The question is, shall the voters postpone indefinitely the discussion of Article 32? All those in favor of postponing the discussion say aye. Aye. Those opposed say nay. Nay! <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> the, 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 nay, the nays appear to have it. <laughs> The nays do have it, and um, the motion is lost, which means that Article 2 is now on the floor. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm just, I'm just, thank you. It's Article 32 is, is back on the floor. So um, you can continue to discuss Article 32, the merits of it, if you would like. And um, go ahead. Thank you. Do you I'm have Kristen a Chandler. Yeah. I do. I just want to acknowledge that we had two high school students here. We have one who spoke a while ago who took his Saturday and came down here. And the first person to respond to him suggested that we table this motion, which I found very disappointing. And I just want to acknowledge you too. I'm sure this isn't where you want to be on a Saturday. So thanks for coming to town meeting.
<laughs> yeah, it's a good time. It's a good time. It's hard, but it's good. Productive. Cliff Rand, Ken Randolph Center. This is a passionate issue. We all care very deeply about our environment. That's why we live here. I love this place. I love the greenery. I do want to say that words matter. Commas matter. There's a company in Maine that will tell you for the omission of an Oxford comma, it cost them a million and a half dollars. Okay, that's the extra comma before the and. Okay, word it correctly. I think it's really important. Be specific. Thank you. So I'm looking for I'm looking for speakers who have not had any opportunity yet to speak on this, and we'll we'll get to you. If, so if you pay attention to that, if you won't, don't mind. <coughs> uh, Marty Strange from South Pleasant Street. Um, commas do matter, but they don't always matter, and they matter on matters of great importance, but this is a sense of the town's feelings. It's not anything that is going to be taken into a court where a comma is going to be result in some disastrous consequence for us. This is us standing where we stand and saying what we believe in, and that's all this is about, and we can put all the technical stuff aside because it doesn't matter. Irene Schaefer, I live in Randolph. I would like to add my comments to the young people. I am possibly the oldest person in this gathering at age 91. And, and I wish you the same environment that I've had in my lifetime and I feel very responsible for my generation and what we've done to our environment. Unknown, probably, as we went through life. However, this needs to be kept in the forefront. And this is just something that is going to the people who represent us and urge them to finally take a stand and do something for you and your, your children, your grandchildren. So I'm supporting you totally, and thank you for coming. Um, good afternoon, Victor Yaleggio Randolph. Um, I start by saying I support this completely. Um, with with a couple with a couple with one question, um, it's a serious attempt to urge our people in Montpelier to get their behinds off the ground. Okay, but more importantly, if it's very serious, then you shouldn't. I don't think we should be including things which are less serious and maybe cut into to it. So I'm, lo I'm looking particularly at two uh, A, protecting town properties from fossil fuel infrastructure, denying easements and agreements for pipelines crossing town properties. Does the town have any reasonable expectation that it could have any meaningful input to such a question should it come to the point where there's either a, uh, a state or a federal or a transnational initiative to push, you know, whether it's frack gas pipeline or a high, uh, high voltage electric or anything like that under Randolph property? I really question whether that's a serious, you know, that's a serious expectation on the part of the town. So if it's going to remain a very serious piece of work to send to the state, I think we should eliminate something like that, which sort of cuts into the seriousness. That's all. Thank you very much. Yeah, we're good. <laughs> Other speakers who have not had an opportunity to speak? I see a hand over here up against the wall. Peggy Whiteneck again from East uh, Randolph. The letter that goes to the um, authorities at the state level does not require, this resolution as I read it, does not require that the wording of the resolution itself be sent to them. 
it, it requires that something be sent to them that expresses, again, as somebody put it, the will of the, the voters from, uh, from, from Randolph. So, you know, the, the wording of that letter is, is not prescribed precisely here, so that I don't think we have to spend a lot of time talking about wordsmithing. Okay, thank you. I, um, pe some people might like to speak a second time, and you're, you're, you're welcome to do that. I'm um, okay. <laughs> if what, let me make a bargain with you because that involves a whole separate vote. Let's have Mr. Pimenthal speak one last time since he helped organize this. Uh, and then just we'll a couple of take the temperature of, of the room. Clarification: This this resolution in no way imposes any requirements on homeowners. There is no expectation that homeowners do anything differently ten years from now than what they do today. Um, the, the, it refers to infrastructure, which has nothing to do with homeowners' uh, heating systems. Number two is, you know, not knowing whether or not there's a fossil fuel pipeline on the horizon for us is no reason for us not to say today that we don't want something like that in our own backyards or running through our town. By the time we find out that there's something coming through town, it's going to be too late. We need to take a stand in advance and, and state that we don't want anything like that running through our town. Thank you. A point of clarification. A point of clarification. Okay. Uh, uh, because the actions taken by the voters here today will undoubtedly land on the desk of the select board and, and my desk to, to resolve later, especially crafting of a letter if it's required. Uh, I just want to be clear. I, I'm hearing from from the supporters of the group that language doesn't matter, that this is advisory only, that they're not directing the town to do something. I want to make sure that I understand the, the group that's supporting this, this, um, this article so that when a letter is drafted at some point at a select board meeting, someone doesn't say, well, no, we were serious. We want X, Y, and Z. I will then in front of everybody here, I'm committing and I'm saying, well, no, at the meeting, at town meeting, and the minutes reflect that everyone said this was advisory only, that it is the, the specific words don't necessarily matter, and it's more of an advice given to the select board. So I want to be clear if, if this is a general advisory or if this is a serious, you are demanding X, Y, and Z from the select board and from me so that I can later on go with that. I'm very much a, there's a goal, I need to get to that goal. And if someone leaves, things open to interpretation, people may not like my interpretation because those are, they vary by different people. So I just want to be very clear with what everyone's asking so with this letter. Th thank, you for, thank you for your comment. I mean, the article is on the floor. People can vote it up or down. The article as exactly as written will go before um, the select board. They'll have that language to, to figure out what the next step is. Um, um, Mr. Pimenthal, you've had two opportunities to speak and you only get two. Um, yeah, Miles Hooper. Uh, I think quite simply, we're asking that it be known in Montpelier to our representation and to our state government that Randolph is keen about finding solutions to address climate change. That's what we're talking about here today. We want that it, the sentiment to be known in Montpelier that people in Randolph feel this way. That's all. Thank you. Um, we'll let Ms. Morgan speak and then Ms. Carruthers. And I have blown off a, a request to call the question, which I'll have to take back up. Uh, Tamara Morgan, East Randolph. Um, I would argue that in terms of language, oh, no. it would probably be perfectly fine to send to the state, which is what the letter, is, who the letter is going to, um, the two first paragraphs, whereas extreme and erratic temperatures and whereas the state of Vermont has a goal, um, and part one A and B, be the letter. 
because the rest of it is addressed to the town of Randolph and we don't necessarily need to send a letter to ourselves. We've already addressed this in town meeting. Just a thought. Ms. Carruthers. Uh, Josie Carruthers, East Randolph. Um, Adolfo, there'll be people to work on that uh, issue, um, to work with the select board, to work with you. Um, so I, I understand your, I understand all of your points. I, I honor your points. Um, and I think that this is, uh, nothing in this resolution today indicates that there would be no, uh, no cooperation in the production of this. So uh, this is a democratic town. We can all keep working together. Um, and um, I'd like to move the question. Okay. Let's see. Um, one more, Kelly. Oh, we have one more. Um, hi, Ilya Andreev again. Um, I just wanted to um, show a slight disagreement with Mr. Hooper, is it? Um, while we are trying to send a message to Montpelier, it, we are also trying to improve situations here in Randolph. Um, one of our goals is actually to uh, insulate the school. Um, it's a pretty simple goal, um, but it will be a very, a very good uh, long-term decision. Um, and yeah, thank you. Okay. The article, we're on Article 32, and I'm sensing from the room that you would like to now take up and vote on Article 32. Um, so, Article 32, I, I'm not going to reread it to you, um, but Article 32 uh, is asking you um, to, you know, a, a vote yes or I will adopt Article 32. A vote nay will um, ask that the article be lost. Okay, do you understand that? All right. So, all those in favor of passing and adopting Article 32 say aye. Aye. Those opposed say nay. Nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it, and Article 32 is adopted. We are, we are going to move on to Article 33. Article 33 says, shall the town voters authorize an exemption to the Randolph Center Area Fire Association from real estate taxes for a period of one year. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, if, if those of you that were here at last town meeting remember uh, this issue was uh, discussed and the select board and, and administration was asked to negotiate with the Randolph Center Fire Association, um, which is why this issue is back on the ballot this year. So um, it's, it's here because the, the, the voters asked us to negotiate with them to see whether uh, or not we would acquire the, the fire station. Um, we have not really made it very far with the negotiations for a number of different reasons, which is why this one article is back on the, um, as an article, uh, but only for one year. Other discussion about Article 33? Actually, we have reached an agreement in that we signed a lease with the town. The town is leasing the fire station. Um, I don't see the association turning over that uh, property in the foreseeable future. Um, I'd like to uh, offer an amendment to the motion. I'd like to amend it to five years instead of one. So this doesn't have to be brought up every year. Mm -hmm. 
there is a motion to amend Article 33 to replace um, the phrase one year to five years. And I think that motion is germane, that amendment is germane. Um, is there a second? Second. Who seconded that? Mr. Silloway seconded that. So um, on the table now, before you now for discussion, is, is whether to amend the article. I have a number of questions in this regard, but let me uh, try. My memory is not fresh on this, so I'm going to turn to some that may have better uh, information here. But I know that there was a bond that was taken here to be able to rebuild the uh, fire station, and it ended up being, it was done with the expectations that there might be some left over to, to be able to consider doing some other things with, if I'm correct. And I know that in the process, the Randall Center one really was not kind of out of the loop on that center, on that piece. So I'm wanting to know, is this request to consider having the taxes um, abated for at least this year and maybe five, related to the fact that the Randolph Center really did not get any, any improvements related to the building that was just rebuilt here? So I, I, I want to be clear, I, I do oppose the amendment. Um, I feel that this is a bigger part of the ongoing conversation with review of uh, fire operations. Um, as far as improvements to the Randolph Center fire station, the town cannot make any improvements. The town does not own the property. It doesn't own the structure. Um, and using taxpayer money to make improvements to this building is, is and I, it's putting it very loosely would be similar to making improvements to my home with taxpayer money. Uh, we don't own the property, so it's very challenging for us to make the case to improve it. The other challenge there is we do need fire protection in these fire stations as proof that we lost one fire station due to fire. We didn't have fire suppression in it. We almost lost a second one two, three years ago because we didn't have fire suppression in it. And if we don't have sprinkler systems in the fire station and something is to happen, we lose all of the equipment in there. Um, and in the case of Randolph Center, we do not own the building, so we cannot use your money um, as we would to put a sprinkler system in, a in your building, in this building, for, for example. So, uh, the town, for the most part, owns everything. There, there are still issues with, with um, who owns one of the trucks or who owns one of the other trucks. So it's not as clear as in the town owns all of the equipment. Um, Tim is here, he can specific, he's a fire chief for Randolph Center. He can specifically point to some of the fire trucks are not in the name of the town. So now there are competing issues with who's insuring the truck, who owns the truck if it is to burn. Uh, is the town going to be replacing that fire truck if it doesn't own it? Um, so that, there, there are greater issues, which is why you all asked us last year to negotiate with the group which is why I'm, I'm suggesting that we keep it one year so we can keep the negotiation ongoing because if it's a five-year tax abatement, you know, for all we know, no one's going to want to talk about this until year four and a half, right before town meeting. So um, there's a couple hands up. I saw your hand up, Mr. Penrod. There's a, two people in the back that had their hands up first. And what I'm going to ask you all to do is uh, to and you're doing it, but just to the extent you can, keep your comments about the amend, the proposed amendment from one year to five year. But this seems all, this, this conversation has all seemed relevant to that. Randy Clark, all I can say is, when that tone goes out for a fire, we're not gonna pick and choose coming to your house. We're all gonna respond to knock it down as fast as we can. So stop the nitpicking, figure it out, and get over it. Thank you. There's a, a hand behind you. My name is Ran Nancy Rice from Randolph Center. And I just want to say that this article 
is really authorizing an exemption to the taxes for a period of time. And it seems to me these um, comments about prices of fire trucks and stuff. Hold, hold that microphone right oh. to your mouth. It seems to me we should be voting on the issue of it um, giving Randolph Center Fire Association exemption from real estate taxes, not going into all the weeds. Thank you. I, I think Ms. Gage had a speaker here. Uh, Michael Marshall. Um, so I am in favor of the one-year um, exemption, but I am not in favor of the five-year exemption. As the town manager stated, um, this is an issue that's been going on for over a year now, and I think if we extend it, um, this issue and this debate will continue for years. Um, it's putting our town in danger. Um, it's holding up things. For example, the village fire station, which burned, um, it's four and a half years later, and they still haven't replaced all of their equipment. That's on hold because there's a study to find out what goes on with the stations. So that needs to be taken care of. In East Randolph, a tanker truck is very old, constantly in need of repair. That purchase is being put off until this whole situation can be taken care of. So we really need to get this issue taken care of so that all three fire departments can be providing the adequate protection and we're not pushing off capital purchases for years down the road while we deal with this issue. So again, I'm in favor of the one-year exemption, but not in favor of the five-year exemption because we need to get this straightened out and taken care of. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Penrod, did you have a question about the amendment or a comment? No? About the, co about the amendment? Um, th this is procedural. Um, when this, my understanding of this article on the ballot as it's written, not the amendment, um, was a revisitation of the issue from last year and being an independent group asking for a real estate taxes exemption, um, they would have to gather signatures to get it on the ballot. That has not been done, so I'm not in favor of the five-year exemption. Okay. I'm not seeing uh, any other hands. Uh, well, I have a, a question on that because last year it was warned as a five-year exemption and it got changed to a one-year, so why, why did that work last year but it can't work this year? The other, um, the other thing is that the discussion of who will own the Randolph Center Firehouse is not holding up the fire service study the fire service service study is holding up the discussion on who will own the firehouse. Now, the other thing is that this fire service study was supposed to have been done by now, and it just barely started two months ago after they finally got people appointed to it. They're supposed to meet every two weeks. And it's it's supposed to be done within six months, and they, they've had one meeting, well, two meetings, a second meeting, I think only four people showed up. And I don't see this study being done within the next year. So I'm, we'll probably have to bring this up again next year unless we go with the five years. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, please, Mrs. Zuko. Uh, this question about tax exemption for the Randolph Center, the, the Randolph Center Fire Association, the, the fire station building in Randolph Center, keeps coming up every time we have a vote to exempt the taxes on it. This has been going on for a very long time. I've been serving as town clerk for 22 years. We've done this every five years for the past 22 years. Last year, we voted to change it to one year because the idea that it is an independent group that is actually owning the building and looking for a tax exemption um, was a question that, you know, why, why are we giving them a tax exemption? Why, why, are, why don't we give tax exemptions to other people? So I think we need to, as a group, as a town, decide, um, you know, once and for all, okay, this is the fire association, they are an independent group. If they're going to ask for the exemption under the statute, then they will need to follow the same rules that other 
third parties have to do in order to request either uh, a special appropriation or, or whatever. And that is to get out a petition, get the required signatures, and then that will put it on the onto the town warning. We have traditionally just put it on the warning because it has been used as a fire station for the benefit of the town. But I don't think that it ever was voted on the way that it probably should have if you really look at the statute and look at the way that questions are, if it's from a third party, it's supposed to be added to the warning. So I think we as a town need to, to decide, okay, are we going to, um, you know, treat them like everybody else, in which case then they need to go through the petition process and then go through that. Um, but for right now, I myself uh, am in favor of just a one year. Hand, we have a hand up in the back. I'm on it. <laughs> We're getting hungry, aren't we, people? Um, I have a question. If we decided to vote this down, would that provide um, our town with any leverage for resolving the ambiguous status of that center? Uh, Mr. Bailon has his hand up. Uh, as part of our very long and ongoing uh, meetings with the Randolph Center Area Fire Association, we, as Tim pointed out, uh, eventually after several months of talking, came up with a lease agreement. Uh, at the request of the Fire Association, they placed a sunset date of the end of this fiscal year, June 30th. Uh, I, I will ask Tim to ask why he, he insisted on placing that in there. I can only mention that it was put in there so if the voters today chose to not give the association a tax exemption, that they would choose to potentially not operate anymore because again, they own the property, they own the building. So um, I can say that if the voters today chose to not grant a tax um, exemption, the issue would then fall to the association on whether they want to pay the tax uh, and continue to operate as a fire station or if they chose to just ask the town to take its equipment out. Um. On page 31 in your annual report, your town report, stabilization of taxes. I assume that's what we're talking about because Randolph Center Fire Station is at the top at one year. Does anybody else remember giving an exemption by vote here at the town meeting for Freedom Foods or Randolph Senior Citizen Center or Gifford Medical Center, Midig? MINIG or LED Dynamics, I don't remember voting for those things. Why are we having this kind of a discussion when it seems to me that either the town manager or the select board has, seems to have the authority to grant these kind of stabilizations? Can anybody answer that for me? I'm going to direct uh, this. Joyce might be able to answer that for you. Some of the names that you listed on there are based on tax stabilization agreements that the select board has made with Freedom Foods, with the LED Dynamics. We voted on last year on the Senior Center to provide the exemption for five years, and the Senior Center did provide us with a petition to, in order to do that. Um, the one for Gifford was a settlement with a uh, tax appeal um, where um, the Manic nursing home was to be, you know, they, they claimed that it should not be taxed. The town's position was that it should be. Uh, we reached an agreement that um, for the first few years there would be an exemption and then over time they will begin paying taxes on it. Under the statute, there are certain groups that fall under the statute that can request to have the, the exemption. Um, I don't remember exactly, I think it's in Title 32. So can, hang on, hang on, can we? Yeah, um, so 
I want to keep the conversation as much as we can to the amendment at this point, right? And we have um, Ms. Putney who has not spoken on this article. I was just responding to Michael Penrod and what Joyce was saying, that if you look on page 14, the minutes from last year, Article 31, and it is the authorization exemption for the Randolph Senior Center, and it's Vermont Statute 32, squiggly symbol 3840. Okay, and I have the statute here, and it says, when a society or a body of persons associated for a charitable purpose in whole or in part, including the fraternal organizations, volunteer fire, and ambulance or rescue companies, own real estate used exclusively, exclusively the, for the purposes of such society, body, or organization, such real estate may be exempted from taxation either in whole or in part for a period not exceeding 10 years if the town so votes. Upon the expiration of such ex exemption, a town may vote additional periods of exemption not exceeding five years each, which is why each time it's now five years or one year, depending on what you put it for. Okay. Um, our future is leaving the building. Yep. Yeah. The, yeah. Bye, guys. The question before you is about um, the amendment. And um, Mr. Angel, you've, ha you've actually spoken twice on this, so I'm, I'm not going to let you speak again. Um, we're going to see if anyone wants to continue discussing the amendment. All right. You're ready for the question. The question is on amending the main motion by changing uh, the last clause from a period of one year to a period of five years so that if the amendment is adopted, the main motion shall read, shall the town voters authorize an exemption to the Randolph Center Area Fire Association from real estate taxes for a period of five years. Those in favor of amending the main motion to state five years, say aye. Aye. Those opposed, say nay. Nay. The nays appear to have it. The nays do have it. And the amendment is lost. What that means is that Article 33, as printed in your, in your report, is now still up for debate, discussion, and, um, and, and if there's none, we'll vote on it. I'll give you a minute to see if there's anyone else that wants to discuss Article 33. Just clarification as far as the uh, lease agreement expiring uh, the end of June, I just felt it um, would be a lot simpler if the lease agreement corresponded with the fiscal year. I don't see any reason why the lease won't be extended. Um, the other, the reason we did the lease agreement was for the insurance company to make sure that all equipment would be covered in case of a fire. So there is no question now about whether or not ownership has nothing to do now with uh, whether or not it will be covered. Thank you. All right. I have one more hand. Janet Angel. My husband's fire chief. I have a son on the fire department. My son-in-law is also on the fire department. I just want you to remember that this is not a good old boys club. These guys are on call 365 days a year, 366 this year. <laughs> That's right. And they also put in a lot of time. They, without getting the minimum pay per hour that they get for meetings and attending fires, um, I think we should support our fire department. We need them when we need them, not when it's convenient. Thank you so much. Okay, Article 33, 
It appears that you are ready for the question. The question is, shall the town voters authorize an exemption to the Randolph Center Area Fire Association from real estate act taxes for a period of one year? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes have it, and Article 33 is passed. The last uh, item on our um, agenda is to do any other business proper to come before this meeting. And I actually have just a short little one, which is to say this. Um, going forward into the future, I, I think it is absolutely amazing when citizens um, go through the petition process and get stuff on the warning. I think that makes a lively town meeting, and I think, I think you should do more of it. You actually have significant power, and you can use it. I am available all year, not just on this day, but I am available all year to help you draft um, articles so that they get done whatever it is that you want to get done. So in advance of taking a petition to the town, just uh, look me up and I'll, I'll help you do that. That's absolutely part of the job. Um, and that also goes for the select board and whoever else is writing, writing the, the, the warrant is that in advance, I would love, and I've always asked, to get a draft so that I can catch typos and fix things. I don't make, or would never even suggest to make, substantive changes. I don't care about the substantive changes, but to make the articles be um, as easy and efficient to uh, discuss as possible. That's my other business. Are you done? Yeah, I'm done. Okay. Um, thank you, Kelly. She's yeah, okay. fabulous. <laughs> I have one request of everybody. Um, I wear a bunch of hats tonight. I'm the house manager here for the concert. When you get up, could you please put your seat up so we can not avoid having to do that and put up seats that you see that are down that are around you. Thank you. We do have somebody back here who wants to speak. Jessica Taffet Walters, Randolph Center. Um, I want to speak regarding us switching town meeting from Tuesday to Saturday. Um, it seems like there are less people here than in previous years, and our family is actually one that benefited. Um, my husband hasn't been able to attend town meetings in past years um, on Tuesdays, but it does seem that there are less people, so I don't know if we want to continue with this new... Actually, it's about the same number. Oh, it is? Okay, never mind then. You know, there was also there were there were also people as of like yesterday telling confused people as of yesterday were like, oh, it's tomorrow. You know, so yeah. it, one thing would be to do is to give it some time and to spread the word, publicize town meeting because we want that not, we want numbers to go up. Uh, I have one comment uh, about the uh, police district whether we sh whether this group should create a warrant for next year in terms of the additional outside of the police district that the sheriff department is uh, taking care of and we're paying into it. You can't do that today, but you can do that anytime you want. If you want to come up, if, if you or a group of people in town want to come up with a, an item for the warrant, you can get together, call me, and um, draft something to petition. Uh, okay, hang on. Let's do Chris and Gage. I know Joyce has a comment too, other business. We're going to get to everyone. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, I'm Ann LaPearl, and I live in Randolph. And I just wanted to let everyone know that this is Joyce's last term. <gasps> Wait, what? And... No, 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 what? Yeah, she's leaving in uh, March of next year. And I'm, yeah, yeah. Big round of applause for Joyce. I, 
Guys, I just also want to say real quick that I am the assistant town clerk and assistant treasurer for the town of Randolph, and it's been my absolute pleasure to serve as your assistant. And I'm going to miss you very much. And I hope, yeah, I hope that uh, you enjoy your grandkids in retirement. Thank you. Yes. I'd Thank also you like to, real quick, mention a couple other people that have left the town after long term service that have not been recognized. You know, Marty Sanchez was here for 20 years, you 26. know. 26. Wendy Tucker, who right. also retired last year, was here for 34, Five. 35, Almost 35 years. you know, and um, Pat, who left a couple years ago now, but, you know, it's... Um, and Roy Fifield, who served in the water sewer department for 29 years. Right. Uh, they weren't mentioned in the town report, which was unfortunate, and I think they should have, and I think the town should show their appreciation for the long years of service to this town. Yeah. Right, absolutely. Thank you. Are you getting a 20-year encore, George? No. no. <laughs> does, any, does, any, does anyone want to say anything first about that? that? That's huge, right? When's the party for Joyce? That's what I want yeah. to know. Uh, this, this, Chris, I wasn't going to talk about this subject, but as long as you've asked, I will say, can I make a motion that her retirement be denied? <laughs> Is that yeah. Yes. <laughs> no, I'm not going to do that. Yeah, that's right. Uh, when you're ready, though, Kelly, I have so something else real quick. Please, go okay. ahead. Okay, so thanks. Um, Chris Recchi, again, Teacher Hill Road. <laughs> Um, as some of you may know, I'm now Managing Director of ValleyNet, which is the operating company for EC Fiber. We build, design, operate the EC Fiber network. Actually, believe it or not, after many, many years and being signed up, um, we are building in Randolph this year. We expect to be done by the end of the year. There are cards out in the alley, but we're actually doing a raffle for, free, for people who subscribe anew. Um, we're doing a free upgrade uh, of the internet service up to 800 megabits per second, very fast, and uh, free installation. So please take a card, look at the things. This is your community's fiber network. It's owned by the 22 towns, 23 towns that are operating it. So. Um, this is not a sales pitch as much as it is a support your local organized internet to get rural broadband to every single home that's on a public road. So thank you, Kelly. Thanks very much. Thanks for your patience. I won't belabor this, but I have cards here too if people want to pick them up. Thank you. Um, so town meeting is not over. I know pe some people want to leave and I would say, sneak out right now really fast. they will give you 30 seconds, but then you know, we're going to continue here with other business. A lot of times there's super important stuff that comes out at other business, like these two last announcements. <laughs> Marty Strange from South Pleasant Street. I think the nuances of all the discussion around climate change was very important, go beyond the mere language that's in the uh, Article 32. And I have to express a little bit of uh, uh, concern that there's so few select board members here to have heard that conversation. This is the fewest select board members I think I've ever seen at a town meeting. I don't know if the change of date uh, has affected their attendance, but I think it's a big wound to our system if they're not present. I mean, obviously, anybody can have a problem and not be able to come. I, I, I understand that, but four out of five is a big number. And uh, when it comes time to drafting that letter that goes out to state officials about our position on climate change, we want to really well informed select board that has the nuances of what the discussion was here today in place and we're not going to have that. Well, one good thing that we do have is that this has been videotaped today. And also, I know that Joyce records the meeting um, well, for notes, partially. partially records. Okay, but we do have, we do have a, a, a recording and um, perhaps someone can write to the select board and, and suggest they review a certain segment of that video. Uh, part of the problem is school vacation gets scheduled during this week because there's a day off. Uh, horrible. It's me again. 
I would just like to point out to the handful of people that are still here that Winterfest got more than 2,000 people to come out and play games and drink beer and have a good time, which I think is absolutely fantabulous for this place. But look around. How many empty seats were there here earlier? Okay. I think this town needs to figure out a way of having the town meeting be the Winterfest. Uh, many of you in this room have stopped by Town Hall on uh, different occasions to ask a question, to share your views. Uh, I just wanted to uh, continue to encourage you to do that. Um, I just want to be very clear that I'm very old school politics, and that means we don't have to agree to get along. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, disagreeing, a lot of it is, 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 is how we learn. You know, I don't know it all, even though I tell my mom I do, and she thinks I'm right. Um, at least that's what she tells me. But... Uh, I just want you uh, all to know that the door is always open. Again, even if it's a tough issue that you are concerned about bringing to me or if you don't think people see it your way, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. It's your view and we want to hear it. So please, please come in. We don't have to agree. If we don't agree, I will tell you why. And if I don't know the answer, I will tell you. I will get you the answer. Same thing with the select board, I, I'm sure. But please stop by. Please ask the question. Please use your town as a resource. You, you pay our salary. So... Uh, please come in to ask questions and to, to tell us what you're thinking um, in a nice way. Just want to say that in a nice way. <laughs> Anyone have not have a chance to speak yet at, at, for other business? Ms. Mrs. Forbes, I think. Oh, Mr. French, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. Thank you. Um, Matt Fordham is leaving the select board this year after helping the town for a couple of years here. And I just would like a round of applause for his time on the select board. I don't know that this requires emotion or anything, but this is a really beautiful town report, and particularly the cover yeah, in the back and the dedication. So thank you all for that. But I think something that would be handy, we used to have it in the, in the Randolph um, telephone book, uh, there was an insert with all the names of the people who are in our government and who represent us and their telephone. Is it in there? I didn't see it. Great. Thank you. That's it. Back page. <laughs> Ms. Hafner. Okay. Martha Hafner. And a uh, couple comments. I know one of them may have some explosive kinds of concern, reaction to it, but um, one, I do want to just support my husband. We often, <laughs> we, we sometimes don't agree on things. I want to just let you know that. <laughs> um, but, but I do support his concern on potential. We lived in a setting where they wanted to bring in huge amounts of infrastructure into the, an island that didn't begin to have the resources and it was going to be on the shoulders of the people that lived there. And that kind of concern similar to what could be coming with concerns on our home heating arrangements, et cetera, I think is well merited. Um, and he is, he's an environmentalist and he very much is in line with all of your concerns about seeing things go forth in a healthy uh, community minded and globally environmentally minded way. So that piece I do want to reemphasize. Second, um, there is coming a time soon when there will have to come a decision in, in this community as to whether or not we have a retail outlet for marijuana. And I would like to right now encourage that there be a forum for discussion on that, that the concerns that are emanating from Colorado need to be aired. Our press is not really doing a good job of that. People need to be informed on it before they can truly make a good decision on that. And that's as much as I'll say. Thank you. Other business? Mr. Ayers. Uh, Tom Ayers, Brook Street. And I just want to uh, second Pat French's uh, thank you to Matt Fordham for his two years of service uh, on the select board. Um, many people may know, uh, that barring any unforeseen intervention by the Russians or the Ukrainians, I am running unopposed. 
for, <laughs> for the select board on, um, on Tuesday. And that was a joke. I uh, didn't mean that seriously, uh, for those who might not have gotten it. Um, and I, I just want to assure um, Mr. F Mr. French and uh, Mr. Strange, excuse me, and others that um, uh, well-crafted wordsmithing will be attended to on the climate change issue. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you. Ms. West, if you would Hi. state your name. Uh, Jessamine West. Uh, I just live in the village. I just want to say two things. Uh, one real quick, uh, as I'm a member of the Conservation Commission, along with Ian Blackmore. We have an opening if you are interested in climate change e things and want to have an effect uh, in that area. We mostly take care of the town forests, do public programming and some other things. Uh, talk to one of us if you're interested in serving. And to Martha Hafner's uh, question, there are towns that are going to have to deal with uh, marijuana in retail. I've seen it roll through Massachusetts. It's been fascinating. I want to give a plug for your public library, uh, your amazing public library, as a place where you can actually get carefully curated information about these things. We've got books on the shelves that can speak to, you know, marijuana in general, marijuana in retail, marijuana in comic books, uh, we've got it. Rochester over the mountain has a really good collection as well, as well as public programming. So if that's a topic that you're really interested in learning more about, that's a great place to go do it. Thank you. Okay, the skating rink is closing at 2 <laughs> instead of 3, but it will be open tomorrow. This is your plug from the Recreation Committee. <laughs> I th believe it's the last day, if, given the weather, it may be the last day it's open. Very quickly, does the town have a role in the whale's tails? Do we mow the grass or put in the culvert or should we? That's a question because we have gotten more press out of these two tails and I think the town ought to be contributing to the upkeep. All right. With that, oh. Starving, starving Patsy. I, I just want to say, I wear on my jacket still, your vote is your voice. So don't just come out today, be sure you vote on Tuesday. Or I think, Joyce, can they still come in on Monday and vote absentee or not? <laughs> <laughs> you can vote absentee right up to 4.30 p.m. in the office. Okay. <laughs> You can same-day voter registration right at the polls <laughs> on Tuesday. Okay. So your vote is your voice. Thank you for your voices here. It's all up to you. Kelly, here I am in the back. Okay. Thank you. I'd just like to add um, a couple of comments tying in with the climate change issue. Um, I came across figures that show that the average carbon footprint for people in the United States is 16 and a half metric tons. The average worldwide footprint is five, and the target to combat climate change is two metric tons. And so I'm glad to see that the town is concerned about this. And I also want to add that the US military is the um, single largest institutional consumer of hydrocarbons in the world and has locked itself into weapons that consume those as well uh, for years to come. And recently there was a um, defense authorization bill in Congress which uh, out of 535 votes only had 34 against it. And um, that money, $750 billion, even, uh, I mean, it's used to oppress and kill other people. But that money could be better used for helping with the car climate change issue. And um, I'd just like to bring that up so people can ask their representatives, speaking of your voice is your vote, 
your vote is your voice. Uh, let them know that 34 objecting to that huge budget is unconscionable. Um, so I just wanted to add that because I think some of this is little known information. Thank you. Okay, I think that if there are no objections, we shall adjourn the meeting for today.